Uh, we're not going to pray today. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Government Operations to order. Committee, there's an agenda before us. This committee agreed to adopt the agenda. Great. Thank you, committee. Declarations of conflict of interest. Hearing none, we will move into our main item of business today, public hearing on Bill 29, an act to amend the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Uh, are we also doing human rights? Oh, and Bill 31, Northwest Territories 911 Act. Um, so if you'll give me a brief indulgence, I'll just go through some opening comments and we'll allow committee members to introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Simpson. Good evening, welcome everyone. I'm RJ Simpson, MLA for Haver River North and Deputy Chair of the Standing Committee on Government Operations. Good evening, Danny McNeely, Satu Region. Uh, I'm a board member or a committee member to the Government Operations Committee. Thank you. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Uh, thank you, committee. Uh, my name is Kieran Testard. I'm the member for Cam Lake and the chair of the Standing Committee on Government Operations. And with me at the table are um, April Taylor, our committee research advisor, Jennifer Frankie Smith, committee clerk, and Alyssa Holland, a law clerk for the Legislative Assembly. Uh, today, the Standing Committee on Government Operations is holding a public hearing on two pieces of legislation, Bill 29, an act to amend the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act, and Bill 31, Northwest Territories 911 Act. The Standing Committee on Government Operations is a committee of regular members of the Legislative Assembly. The bills we are reviewing today were introduced by the government, given first and second reading in the Legislative Assembly, and then referred to this Standing Committee for review. This is the last of four consultations that the Standing Committee has held on these bills. We visited Fort Smith, Inuvik, and Fort McPherson earlier this week, and we're holding the final meeting here in Yellowknife before we report back to the Legislative Assembly on these bills during the upcoming March-February sitting of the Legislative Assembly. It is our responsibility as a Standing Committee to consult with residents of the NWT on what they like or don't like about the bills. We would like to hear your views and comments this evening, which will be used by the committee to identify any changes we would like to see made to the bills, and which we will then report back to our colleagues in the Assembly. I wish to briefly describe the intent of these bills. Actually, no, what we'll do is we'll walk through each of the, um, the components of the bill, and then we'll allow you to, uh, to comment as, as needed. But we found that that's a, a better approach because uh, we've done three of these now. And some people kind of got lost in the shuffle. So rather than just reading out a bunch of information, we'll walk through each, each step of it. But I will say that um, uh, just for our process, the first, uh, this is where we're going to do the co consultations. And then we're going to review all the information, all the submissions we receive, the viewpoints of individual committee members, and we'll identify any am uh, amendments we'd like to make to the legislation. And we'll also be completing substantive reports around some of these, all, all three bills in actual fact. And those reports will include recommendations to government on how they can address some of the concerns that can't be dealt with through legislative change. So that includes you know, funding or policy changes that aren't contemplated by the legislation. So this committee has um, tools available to it to address your feedback that are more than just the legislative process. So first, we will discuss Bill 29, an act to amend the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act. This act proposes to amend the existing Access to Information and Privacy, Protection of Privacy Act by providing for the application of the act to municipalities that are designated in regulations. So as, uh, currently, municipalities are not governed by the act, and this amendment will allow all, or will bring all municipalities in the Northwest Territories under the ATIP regime and uh, give them the same responsibilities and requirements as the GNWT. It will clarify the types of records exempted from disclosure because they would if, if they would reveal cabinet or FMB confidences, that's the Financial Management Board, and provide for a similar exemption for municipal records. So certain documents or information contained by the government are uh, protected by cabinet confidence, which means they cannot be 
uh, shared with the general public. What this amendment does is create a defined list of what those exemptions look like and make it easier for um, members of the public to understand what is exempted and what is um, what is in and what is out when they make an information request. And the same kind of criteria will also apply to municipal records um, as well. So that's budgetary documents and uh, council deliberations. Uh, revised timelines by restating them as business days rather than calendar days, shortening some turnaround times for actions to take place under the Act, and adding timelines for some activities that did not previously have timelines. Uh, so that uh, currently the act is stated in calendar in business days and that is creating some challenges especially during the Christmas break when many uh, GNWT employees are not available to process access requests. So by restating the timelines in business days it will allow the government more time to actually um, process requests and get them out the door in a timely fashion and some um, activities were not given timelines in the previous version of the legislation and those activities will be given timelines. Uh, this will, the uh, amendments will set out a process for the Information and Privacy Commissioner to consider requests from the heads of public bodies to extend time limits for responding to requests for access. So this, uh, this change will allow departments who know that they need more time to work on a request to go to the Information and Privacy Commissioner. Previously, um, it would have to, it, it was a, uh, the opposite was true, where a timeline would have to, uh, an applicant would have to go if um, they had a concern that timelines weren't being met. So this allows the government to request extra time. Uh, address the privacy and access considerations related to human resource documents, including employee evaluation and workplace investigation documents. So there was some concern that individuals weren't able to access their personal information if it was part of a human resources investigation uh, or disciplinary hearing or employee evaluation, and this change will clarify that and make it clear that public personal information is personal information regardless of a human, rights pr of a human resources process. Clarify exemptions from disclosure relating to business interests. So much like the cabinet confidences section, this creates a defined list of what is and what isn't an appropriate business interest that can exempt information from being released to a citizen. Permit the collection and disclosure of information for the delivery of common or integrated programs and services. So with this, uh, this section allows the GNWT to set up a common program across departments and to allow those departments to share personal information to serve the needs of that program. Update the general powers of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, um, which we, we'll, we can get into if there's any questions around it, but it just clarifies some of the general powers of the office that have, uh, have been recommended to change over the years the op office has been operating. Provide for a review of the Act by the Minister of Justice every seven years. So this would put a mandatory review into law that would require um, the government through the Minister of Justice to review the legislation to make sure it's current, to recommend any changes, and to act on those changes if required. So we will start with Bill 29. I'd uh, just like to remind everyone that we, um, if you share your views with us today, um, all submissions will be part of the official committee records and this may be reflected in our final report. Any submissions made during this meeting will also be televised and broadcast or may be televised and broadcast via social media. Uh, thank you very much for your patience and allowing for this introduction. With members agreement we can now open the floor to comments from the public. Do members agree? Agreed. Thank you members. Uh, first on our witness list we have the Information and Privacy Commissioner of the NWT, Ms. Elaine Keenan. Thanks. Madam Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and good evening to everybody. And uh, I'm impressed with the crowd. Good to see uh, lots of interest. Uh, before I begin my comments, I would like to introduce Mr. David Lucadellis, QC. Uh, to my right, uh, Mr. Lucadellis uh, served as the Information and Privacy Commissioner for British Columbia from 1999 to 2010, <clears throat> and then as Deputy Attorney General for BC and Deputy Minister of Justice for BC from 2010 to 2012. 
He's taught privacy and access law in the law faculties of both University of Victoria and Thompson, River Univers Thompson Rivers University. Uh, he's worked in the access and privacy space for more than 30 years and is highly respected as someone with a keen passion and deep, uh, for and a deep knowledge and understanding of access to information and protection of privacy legislation. I've asked him to assist me in assessing and responding to Bill 29, and he has graciously agreed to do so. Uh, he will be uh, commenting on parts of the Act um, as we go through our submissions. Uh, I would like to begin by saying how excited I really am to see this bill come to fruition. It's been a long haul and a tough slog, and I have sometimes been impatient in my public comments. I do, however, truly appreciate the time and effort put in by the Department of Justice and everyone else uh, to consult widely and consider many possibilities. My comments will be provided in three sections. The parts of the bill that I fully endorse, the parts of the bill that I see as positive but which require more thought and changes, in my opinion, and finally those things as I see as missing from the bill altogether. So firstly, the things I like and fully endorse, and there are actually many things in, in this category. First amongst those is the groundwork needed to include municipalities under the Act. Um, as you all know, uh, this is something I've been advocating almost since day one of my mandate, some 20 plus years ago. While I can appreciate why there might be reluctance on the part of municipalities to embrace access and privacy legislation, it will, in my opinion, make our local governments more transparent and accountable to the public and provide guidance and direction where none now exists. Municipalities, both la large and small, have been subject to access and privacy uh, laws in most of the rest of the country for many years and all have managed to comply at least to a degree. Will the learning curve be steep? Absolutely, particularly in the smaller communities. Will there be a need for training? Again, absolutely. Will there be a need for additional resources? Probably for some communities, but maybe not as much as might be feared. The first step will be a need to do an inventory of file management systems in place and to upgrade those where necessary. The second step will be to do a lot of training in the roll-up to coming into force of the provisions uh, of uh, the Act in relation to municipalities. I've seen some comments in the press about the City of Yellowknife's concerns and its comparison to its current obligations under uh, the Personal Information Protection Electronic Documents Act, or PIPEDA. PIPEDA is federal legislation, uh, and it pertains primarily uh, to privacy. It has very limited access to information components, and it applies only to commercial activities, which is a very small part of what the city does. So PIPEDA has much narrower, has much narrower parameters than ATIP uh, will have. There will be a steep learning curve, and there will be a need to ensure that a certain lev level of expertise is available. That said, there are ways to provide s some level of expertise without significant additional costs, I believe, to municipalities. Uh, for example, um, a position could be created with the Department of Justice's Access and Privacy Unit, or perhaps in MACA, whose role it would be to assist communities in responding to access requests and advising on privacy concerns. The financial burden does not all have to fall fully on municipalities. All that is needed, in my opinion, is some creative thinking and cooperation. Regardless of how it's rolled out, I would recommend at least a year to allow municipalities to get up to speed. I would further recommend the phasing in of communities, starting with the tax-based communities and expanding to the smaller communities over a longer period of time. It may also be easier to implement Part 2 of the Act, which is the privacy provisions of the Act, than Part 1, which is the access to information, depending on which way municipalities, the way in which municipalities keep their records currently. One of the issues being addressed in Nunavut right now 
is the state of historical records, which, as I noted last week in my address to committee on my annual report, often consists of boxes and storage with no indexing and no real organization. <coughs> There will absolutely be obstacles and there will be problems, but I'm confident that NWT municipality is up to the challenge and I think it will improve uh, uh, local government in a large way. So another positive amendment is the repeal of, in section 14 of subsections B and F. Um, I've commented on these in my written submissions on page 10 and 11. Section 14 provides for a discretionary exemption to the disclosure advice from officials. Section 14B currently allows a public body to refuse to disclose information where that disclosure could reasonably be expected to reveal, and I quote, consultations or deliberations involving officers employees, or employees of a public body. Section 14F does the same in relation to contents of agendas and minutes of meetings. Section 14B in particular has been used fairly frequently to attempt to withhold access to fairly innocuous and non-controversial information and I'm pleased to see these sections now removed from the Act. I was also very happy to see the amendment to Section 23.4e which opens the door to the disclosure of more specific information about the remuneration of GNWT employees. Other Canadian jurisdictions have been disclosing specifics about what their employees get paid for many years, and this amendment leads us in a positive direction. <clears throat> While it may be a small thing, I'm also very happy to see the amendment to Section 24.1, which prohibits the disclosure of certain commercial information belonging to third-party businesses. The current wording of our legislation was way out of whack with the rest of the country. Uh, making it far more likely that information could be withheld or can be withheld under this section. The amendment will now align our, this, our exception in this regard with the rest of the country. In part two of the Act, which deals with protection of privacy, I was very happy to see the addition of section 49.1, brackets 1.1, uh, which allows the Information and Privacy Commissioner to initiate a review of a privacy matter without the necessity of a formal complaint being received. This will allow my office to undertake a review when I hear about a breach, but no one has come forward with a complaint. And I can use for, as an example, the discovery of sensitive files in a dump. Uh, there was no complaint on that, uh, but it clearly was uh, an issue that needed to be reviewed. This is a provision already in the Health Information Act, which is why I am conducting a, a review of that issue already. Um, but it deals only with health records, and uh, this provision is missing from all other government agencies, for all other government agencies. Finally, on the 100% support side of things, I'm very happy to see that the fines for offenses under the Act are increased to $10,000, and to see the inclusion of the uh, to see the inclusion of the improper destruction of records and the accessing of personal information without proper authority added to the offenses. While the the offense provisions under the Act have never yet been used. Uh, they do act as a uh, deterrent, and uh, the increased fine will increase that deterrent value. So this brings me to the amendments of the Act, which are welcome, but either uh, do not, in my opinion, go far enough, or do not fully address the issues they are meant to address. These provisions are the ones I spent a lot of time on in my written submissions, and I would invite you all to, re to review those. The first one deals with the public interest override. A public interest override provision is a provision which requires the disclosure of information that is in the public interest, even if it might otherwise meet the criteria for an exception uh, to disclosure under the Act. The amendments do provide for a public interest override, but those changes do not go far enough in terms of when it will apply, and the mechanics of the provisions are such that it will, in, rea in reality, have virtually no impact at all. Because Mr. Lucadellis has had far more experience with dealing with public interest override provisions, I have asked him to speak to this particular issue, and I'd like to hand over the mic to him. Yes, uh, Mr. Lucadellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. And, uh, 
I'd like to begin um, by saying that, as you'll have gathered, for the entire time I was the Commissioner in British Columbia, the Commissioner here, uh, Ms. Keenan Banks, was a, a colleague of mine. Um, and if you'll allow me, I did want to um, underscore, based on my long-standing experience with her, um, how very, very good she is at her job. She's extremely knowledgeable and acts with integrity and has great respect around the federal, provincial, territorial table of information and privacy commissioners. And if you'll allow me, I, I, I will say that I believe the Northwest Territory is very fortunate to have her and have had her as commissioner for as long as she's been serving. All access to information laws are, of course, in some sense based on the recognition that it is in the public interest, the interest of the public at large, that as much government information as possible be made available. Access to information, <coughs> excuse me, is in the public interest because it helps hold governments to account for their actions and decisions. And of course, it also helps members of the public inform themselves about government policy and exercise their vote in a much better informed manner. And of course, the right of access to information is not absolute, and all of these laws protect other countervailing important public interests by enabling certain information to be withheld. But those exemptions, those protections are limited in number, again in recognition of the overriding public interest in access to information. That public interest is honoured in all laws by ensuring that even the access exemptions, the protections must be sometimes overridden by the public's right to know. And that's often done through independent review. And as the Commissioner has noted, Bill 29 would commendably, if I may say, introduce a public interest override. But as she has also pointed out, the proposed public interest override amendment um, has some weaknesses in it that will, if it's enacted in the current form, ultimately lead to that public interest override, rarely, if ever, successfully being used. Um, first, uh, the proposal uh, does not, as the Commissioner has said in her written submissions, go far enough because it would only allow the public interest and access to information to override only four of the Act's disclosure exemptions, advice from officials, which is an important consideration, uh, and it's laudable that it's included as one of the protections that can be overridden in the public interest, intergovernmental relations, economic interests of the government and harm to another individual or to the applicant. <coughs> It's true that a similar approach is taken on Ontario's law. In fact, the wording of the proposed Section 5.1 uh, here is similar to the Ontario language in a number of fashions, in a number of ways. The Ontario version, however, goes further because it lists many more of that law's access exemptions than Bill 29 would do. In other words, many more of the protections for information can be overridden by the public interest in the Ontario version because the list of protections that can be overridden is, is longer than what is proposed in Bill 29. Um, I would respectfully suggest that an even stronger approach than either the Bill 29 uh, proposal or the Ontario approach uh, is found in the laws, the access to information legislation in Alberta, British Columbia, PEI and New Brunswick. The laws in Alberta and British Columbia uh, for one thing, provi provide that the public interest override can prevail over all of the protections under the legislation, not just a list of four or five or what have you. And for that reason alone, uh, those two laws uh, go somewhat further, certainly, than, than Bill 29 would. Um, another reason uh, that one might think Bill 29 would not go far enough with the public interest ride, uh, override is that it sets a very, very high bar for it to apply. The public interest would win out and require information to be disclosed, despite protection under one of the listed provisions, only where there's a compelling public interest in disclosure that clearly outweighs the purpose of the particular exemption in question. Uh, the experience in Ontario, which, as I said a minute ago, takes a very similar approach over the last 30 years that that law has been enforced, 30-odd years, has shown that such a high bar, such a high standard of compelling public interest has resulted in relatively few uses of the public interest override in Ontario. It's used as an exception, really, than more than anything else. I can think of some examples where uh, inspection reports, safety inspection reports for some of the nuclear power plants in Ontario have been disclosed because it's in the public interest that you know, transparency override any concerns that Ontario Hydro might have had about uh, the information being disclosed. But it is a very rarely used provision. So the Northwest Territories has an opportunity here to amend Bill 29 so that information must be disclosed where the disclosure is clearly in the public interest. And that's the uh, bar that is set in Alberta and British Columbia, PEI, and New Brunswick. So it's a lower test of clearly in the public interest. And that's the suggestion in the Commissioner's submission, is that that's the standard that should be used. 
Um, another feature that could be added, uh, again found in Alberta and BC, is that there could be a positive duty for government, for public bodies, to disclose information where it's in the public interest, clearly in the public interest to do so. In Ontario and under Bill 29, the question of the public interest override would only ever get triggered or only gets triggered if someone's made an access to information request, whereas in BC and Alberta there's a positive duty to consider disclosure regardless of whether a request for that particular record happens to have been made by a particular individual. Uh, there's also a duty in these other laws, Alberta, BC, New Brunswick and PEI, uh, to disclose information where, is, where it is about a risk to health or safety or to the environment and that's not a feature that the Bill 29 proposal would introduce unlike these other laws that I've just mentioned. And the very last concern uh, that the Commissioner has expressed about the proposed override is unlike any of the other laws that I've mentioned, the access applicant who's requested the record would have a legal burden to demonstrate, that's the language used, to the public body that there is a compelling public interest in disclosure that clearly outweighs the purpose of any applicable protection. So let's leave our, aside the real practical concerns about how this would happen or how this could work. The real concern in, in substance, in principle, is that even if an applicant was able to make a submission to the public body, the applicant by definition doesn't know what the contents of the requested records are. So quite how an applicant who will almost entirely be in a state of ignorance, if you will, about what the records say or what the surrounding circumstances might be, is expected to meet a legal burden of demonstrating a compelling public interest in disclosure. And I just would respectfully suggest that there's a reason that none of these other laws place that burden on an access applicant. And as the Commissioner said in her submission, um, this is not a feature that, that should go forward in, in Bill 29. To, to summarize, uh, the Commissioner's submission makes it very clear that it's welcome that Bill 29 would improve the Act by introducing a public interest override provision. However, as she's uh, submitted to you, uh, it is too narrow in scope, sets too high a bar for the public interest to prevail, and would inappropriately force applicants to prove that there is a public interest in disclosure. Uh, the fear, of course, is that if it is enacted in this form, Section 5.1 would almost certainly be dead on arrival. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Thank you. Um, moving on then to, to Cabinet confidences and the amendments with respect to Cabinet, confidence, cabinet confidences. Uh, the amendment to Section 13 of the Act outlined a mandatory exception to the disclosure of Executive Council records, uh, previously referred to as Cabinet Confidences. As I suggest in my written submissions during the, uh, as I s suggested in my written submissions during the consultation period, these amendments follow fairly closely the way in which the Legislative Assembly of Newfoundland and Labrador addressed this exception. Uh, I am, however, concerned with some of the wording, in particular, the new section 13.1G would protect, and I quote, any record created during the process of developing or preparing a submission for the Executive Council or Financial Management Board. There is nothing, however, that defines that process or what that process entails and if read in its widest meaning, could apply to just about any government business, whether or not the records contain policy, advice, recommendations, or, or anything of the sort, anything confidential. Even if the document merely sets out facts which are currently not protected from disclosure, uh, for example, um, how many people live in a particular community or what the temperature on a particular day might have been, uh, it's a mandatory section, so it requires that uh, such records be uh, withheld. In my opinion, this subsection should be deleted. That's 13.1g. Other aspects of the Executive Council uh, records section, in my opinion, provide sufficient protection for sensitive cabinet information. Moving on uh, to uh, confidential employment, uh, employment evaluations. I'm concerned about the proposed new Section 22.2, which provides public bodies with the discretion to refuse to disclose personal information that, I, that identifies or could identify a participant in a formal uh, employee evaluation process about the applicant when that information is provided explicitly or implicitly in confidence. This appears to be aimed at protecting formal peer review, uh, the, a formal P 
peer review type process where colleagues evaluate each other, though that is not entirely evident from the wording. This concerns me from a fairness perspective, perhaps even more than from a privacy perspective. A human resources professional will argue that such evaluations have to be anonymous so that evaluation, evaluators can feel free to be open and honest. The opposite consideration, however, is equally concerning. When one knows that they cannot be identified and there can be no consequences for malicious or misleading statements, it's almost an invitation to fudge, shall we say, the truth at times. Such statements may well result in serious consequences to an employee being evaluated and, and impair his or her future prospects. Each employee should, therefore, have the right to know who has said what about them in order to be able to respond fully to negative comments in context. Uh, similarly, with respect to labor relations matters, um, and I have even more concerns about the proposed section 24.1, which would prohibit the disclosure of, quote, labor relations information, close quote, where that disclosure could reasonably be expected to reveal any information whatsoever that has been supplied to or is in the report of an arbitrator, mediator, labor relations officer, or, and this may be the most important part, other person or body appointed to resolve or, re or inquire into a labor relations matter. The wording of these provisions just go too far. The term labor relations is not defined and could potentially be interpreted very broadly. Furthermore, the current wording uh, would, uh, could effectively prevent even the use of uh, lessons learned uh, from, a, um, from such a process uh, for, for their educational value so as to prevent the same things happening again. And I see the potential for a conflict, actually, between section 24.1 and 24.2. Both are extremely res uh, restrictive. Sec uh, while both are, ex are extremely restrictive, section 24.2 allows for parties to a workplace investigation to have at least limited access to information created or gathered for the purpose of a workplace investigation. Section 24.1, however, prohibits the disclosure of information uh, to anybody. It is not clear to me where or whether a, la uh, a labor relations matter and a workplace investigation intersect. And if they do, which provision would, we would prevail? I'm also concerned in today's realm of Me Too that Provisions that allow a public body to hide information about claims of harassment or sexual harassment go the wrong way and suggest a way to cover up such allegations. Section 23, which prohibits the disclosure of personal information where the disclosure would amount to an unreasonable invasion of privacy, already applies to workplace issues so as to protect, to the appropriate degree, disclosure of this kind of information. Sections 24.1 and 24.2 seem to take the exclusions too far. Workplace issues must be considered and adjudicated in a transparent way, and these new provisions dictate less transparency rather than more. Uh, moving on to time extensions. I very much support the changes in the Act which address the extension of time to respond to an access to information request. Sections 6 and 7 of the bill uh, are, are, are the relevant sec sections. In particular, Section 7 adds uh, a Section 11.1 .1, which allows a public body to extend the time for responding to an access to information request uh, only once without the approval of the information in excuse me, Information and Privacy Commissioner. I advocated for this in my uh, submissions in October of 2015 and I'm very pleased to see it included. The only concern I have is that in situations in which the public body has to extend the time for the purpose of consulting with a third party under Section 26, and I'm going to discuss 26 next, um, 
the time frames simply do not coincide. I would recommend that a separate section be included under section 11.1 for situations in which a consultation period pursuant to 26, uh, section 26 is required. Um, so section 26 currently requires public bodies to consult with third parties where, there are, where uh, they are considering disclosing information which may result in either an unreasonable invasion of an individual's privacy or where third party business information may be involved. The current process provides that in such cases, cases, public bodies must give third parties notice of their intention to disclose the information. This is not, this is often not done until close to the end of the initial 30 day response period. So a public body has 30 days to respond to an access to information request. Close to the end of that 30 days, they discover that there are, there's information that they want to disclose and think that should be disclosed, but it may affect the interests of a third party. In this case, they must give uh, the third party notice of this intention. The third party then has 60 days to either consent to the disclosure or explain why they believe the information should not be disclosed. So now we're at 90 days. The public body then has an additional 30 days to make a decision, which must be given to the third parties. Then the third party has an additional 30 days to ask my office for a review of the matter before the records can be disclosed. If a request for review is made by the third party at that point, this kick starts a further delay while the review is done. So counting all this up, even if no review is requested and the third party, the, the third party consultation process, when necessary, extends the response period from 30 days to a minimum of, a, of 150 days, which is five months, give or take. That's under the current system. Now the time frames in the amended version are shortened, uh, but not much. Uh, and the number of days is, uh, is expressed now in business days rather than calendar days. But the process itself is still cumbersome and inefficient and creates very long delays for an applicant seeking information. I recommend doing away with the initial notice period and simply providing that notice be given to the third party that information will be disclosed within X number of days unless the third party asks the Information and Privacy Commissioner for a review of that decision. The number of days for a third party to ask for that review could be 30 business days, giving them essentially six weeks to act. This still creates, this still creates a delay in the response time, but only for six weeks instead of five months. Uh, then we get to the time changes for the Information and Privacy Commissioner's review of the matter. While many of the time frames in the Act have re been reduced slightly, the time allowed for the Information and Privacy Commissioner to complete her reviews <coughs> has, been re has been reduced rather dramatically from 180 calendar days, which is approximately six months, to 60, 60 business days or less than three months. At the moment, I can tell you that I have 28 reviews for which all the work has been completed but for the drafting of the review reports. Of those 28, 17 were, as of today, received in my office more than six months ago. <coughs> uh, if I were allowed only 60 business days, every one of those 20, 28 files waiting in the queue for a report would be, on, would be beyond the proposed time frame. And this is only the files that are ready for a report. I currently have an additional 55 files which are still wait in the investigation stage and most of those are more than three months old already. Clearly, I am unable to meet my current timelines, six months, with my current resources. While I have been given the budget for an investigator and once the position is filled, I should be able to reduce the backlog fairly quickly. 60 business days is simply not enough to complete an investigation properly and to issue a report in most cases. 
While I might be able to reduce the time to complete a report by reducing the time I give to the parties to provide me with submissions, I currently give each side, public body, 30 days and the applicant a further 30 days to respond, and then if necessary, an additional 15 days to provide secondary responses. More often than not, I do not get a public body submissions within those time frames, and extensions are the rule. It is not unusual that it takes a public body, or less often an applicant, four months or more to provide me with copies of the responsive records and submissions. While I always endeavor to keep within the six month time frame, it is not always possible, simply because the parties are either not able or are not willing to, climb, to comply with the time frames provided by my office, where, which are not mandated in the Act. They're my timelines, they're not in the Act. I would strongly recommend that the time frame remain at six months or about 130 business days and that a provision be added to allow the Information and Privacy Commissioner to extend that time frame when necessary for a reasonable period of time. Um, this brings me to the uh, sharing of information for common integrated programs which I am again going to ask Mr. Luca Dellis to address. Dellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to be brief on this. Bill 29 would add a definition to the act of, uh, and I'm quoting here, common or integrated program or service, close quote, and that would be defined as a program or service that provides one or more services through a public body working collaboratively with one or more public body, in the singular, uh, or with an agency or a combination of public bodies and agencies. Uh, and sections 41 and 48 of the Act would be amended to authorize public bodies to disclose and collect personal information where necessary for the delivery of a common or integrated program or service. Um, as the Commissioner has said in her written submission, uh, governments increasingly are delivering services across the silos of government departments and across different governments and agencies, and in some cases with private sector actors, of course. She also noted in her submission uh, that she is supportive of this model of collaborative service delivery and for the sharing of personal information across the silos where that's necessary. At the same time, Bill 29 would leave some doubt about the important question of what exactly a common or integrated program or service is. And for this reason, uh, uh, one uh, possibility would to uh, be would be to amend the definition to amend the uh, proposed provisions uh, so that further structure is required around what is exactly a common integrated program or service uh, one approach would be to require that there be documentation of what this service or program is through a written agreement amongst the participating public bodies and agencies that agreement could be required to clearly state what types of personal information are being handled and to set out the participants' respective obligations, which would include privacy obligations. For example, who's responsible for protecting information against you know, a privacy breach and who does what when a breach happens? If there's a leak of personal information, who amongst all of the parties is to respond and how and when? Uh, another feature that could be uh, added, and I'll be talking briefly about privacy impact assessments in a few moments. Uh, I'll note here only that this is also an area where uh, a requirement for a privacy impact assessment would be very useful before citizens' personal information starts getting shared, you know, across departments, governments, levels of government, and agencies. And as I say, I'll return to that in a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now this brings me to uh, that section of my presentation. Um, about what I think is missing entirely from the amendments. Um, and the first is any changes to the powers of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. Um, as you know, my office makes recommendations only. The Information and Privacy Commissioner has no power to require public bodies to take any specific steps or to disclose any specific record. In, recent, in early years, my recommendations were almost always accepted, but in recent years I have become more concerned about effective, or more to the point, ineffective, this model has become in today's world of information overdrive. By way of example, looking at my 2017-2018 annual report, I issued 14 review reports in which recommendations were made. Of those, in six cases, or 43% of the time, the recommendations in the report were either rejected in whole or in part. In 2016-2017, of 12 reports done in which recommendations were made, the recommendations were rejected or partially rejected in seven cases, or 58% of the time. By contrast, in 2007-2008, 10 years ago, 
Seven review reports were issued and 100% of the recommendations made were accepted. <coughs> We could have an hours long discussion or debate about what factors play into this, including the complexity of the files and the kinds of records that are being requested. Part of the reason, however, is undoubtedly that there are absolutely no consequences for failing to accept the recommendations made by my office. Given the nature of the legislation as quasi-constitutional, it seems that recommendations only may, lo may no longer be adequate. My colleague, Mr. Luca Dallas, would argue strongly, and tried to get me to argue, uh, that the Information and Privacy Commissioner should be able to make binding orders. And if, you, and if you're interested, I'm sure he would share those reasons uh, with you. When all is said and done, however, for a tiny office like ours, a requirement to have formal hearings and take evidence under oath would be de uh, debilitating and unmanageable. I do, however, very much endorse the model adopted in Newfoundland and Labrador, another smallish jurisdiction. In, Newfoundland, in the Newfoundland legislation, the Information and Pri Privacy Commissioner continues to make recommendations only, but if a public body does not intend to accept the recommendations made, they must first make an application to the court for an order allowing them to disregard those recommendations. This approach will do a number of things. Firstly, it will put the onus to take matters to court on the public body instead of on an individual. Public bodies have far more resources and expertise than most individuals to do this. In the 20 plus years I have been in this position, I can count on one hand the number of matters which have been appealed to the court. But there have been many, many more times that I've been told by an individual or corporate applicant that they want to appeal, but they just don't have the resources or the knowledge to do so. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, this change should improve the quality of submissions that public bodies provide to my office during the review process. While some public bodies are very good at outlining the facts and circumstances and reasoning, others clearly provide as little as possible. In one recent instance, although I provided the public body with two full pages of direct questions, the submissions received consisted of one paragraph with six lines of text. So I had to make a lot of assumptions in order to complete my report. Needless to say, the public body was unhappy with my recommendations and as a result did not follow them. I've heard stories of situations in which a public body has made an overt decision to put little effort into a response to my office because recommendations are easily ignored and the decision has already been made not to disclose the information regardless of what recommendations come from my office. Thirdly, uh, this approach would make my office more careful with the recommendations that I make. Recommendation power gives me right now the ability to make recommendations that are wider ranging in scope because I see an opportunity to change how things are done on a wider basis than simply within a particular uh, section of a particular department. I would clearly have to be more careful about making those kinds of recommendations and save them for my annual reports. I would encourage the committee to suggest changes to the bill that would provide for the Newfoundland model the last time I spoke to my colleague, Donovan Malloy, the Information and Privacy Commissioner for Newfoundland, he reported that the system has been working very well for them and that there have been only four or five instances since 2015 when their legislation came into effect in which matters have been referred by public bodies to the courts. In my submission, this is an effective way to give the Act the import it deserves without overburdening either public bodies or the Information and Privacy Commissioner's Office. Um, again, uh, I'm going to hand the mic over to Mr. Luca Dellis to talk about a little bit about the duty to document. Mr. Luca Dellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Commissioner recommended as far back as 2015 that the uh, legislation be amended to include a duty to document key government decisions and has done so again this year. Uh, as she has pointed out, a proper record of key government decisions and actions is a vital part of good government. It is necessary for the fiscally sound and efficient administration of publicly funded programs and services. It underpins the accountability of executive government and key public agencies, including through access to information, and it is also part of the foundation of a proper and archival and historical record. 
As the Commissioner has said in her submission, governments everywhere are moving ahead with electronic information systems and the electronic management of government information. And this makes it more and more important that we have adequate and indeed appropriate documentation of key government decisions and actions. To give you an example, uh, today a decision might be made through an exchange of emails amongst public servants or even text messages with no one person being responsible to retain the relevant emails or to file them properly. Yet this is hardly an adequate record of the decision taken by email exchange, and it jeopardizes sound management of government information, of government itself, but also, again, the historical record. In recognition of this, several jurisdictions around the world <coughs> have created what's called a duty to document. Leading examples are the uh, state of Queensland in Australia. Uh, New Zealand has taken some steps in this direction, and most recently British Columbia has uh, uh, taken some steps through amendments to its uh, Information Management Act. Uh, both Queensland and British Columbia have enacted a statutory duty to document decisions and actions while leaving the details uh, to our archival experts to give direction to public bodies. I should emphasize that none of the examples I've seen from elsewhere, including Queensland, uh, comes anywhere close to requiring each and every government decision or action to be documented. It's not as though these duties to document require, you know, an exchange of emails about where to have lunch uh, to, be, to be documented, right, or to, to have a decision about where to have lunch. What is aimed at is solely a duty to document significant decisions determined agency by agency in accordance with central guidance given by archivists. Examples include decisions about procurement, whether to create or terminate programs or services, to award grants of public monies or to make loans to uh, uh, individuals or organizations, and so on. As the Commissioner has pointed out in her submission, the necessary amendments could be made to this legislation or perhaps to the Archives Act. She has also pointed out um, a, a statutory duty to document is needed in the interests of accountability and good government, and she's urged the committee to consider making this recommendation uh, to government. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I promise I'm almost finished. Um, the next thing that I have on my list that I feel is missing from the legislation is um, a mandatory breach notification requirement. Um, in my submissions to the department uh, in 2015, I encouraged the inclusions of mandatory breach notification for all public bodies, similar to the requirements in the Health Information Act. This would require all public bodies to report privacy breaches to my office. As I noted in my annual report, the number of breach notifications under the Health Information Act has increased dramatically in the last year, and I consider this to be a very positive development because it means, first of all, that employees are now able to recognize a breach when it occurs. Secondly, employees are learning how to deal with a breach appropriately when it does occur. And thirdly, each breach reported teaches us how to avoid the next breach. If there's no requirement to report a breach, it'll be brushed under the, the rug, and we won't learn how to fix the problems, be they as a result of technical, human, or process issues. Breach notification requirements for all public bodies represent the most current developments in access and privacy. Nunavut, actually, led the pack in Canada on this issue and included mandatory breach notifications for all public bodies into its ATIP Act in 2012. I believe that Newfoundland and Labrador has now incorporated a similar provision in its public sector uh, law as well. And virtually all health privacy uh, legislation in the country includes some form of mandatory breach notification provisions. If we're going to modernize our act after 20 years, I would strongly advocate for a mandatory breach notification provision as an essential aspect to that modernization. Um, we have two more topics, and I'm going to ask Mr. Luca Dellis to deal with the issue of privacy impact assessments. Mr. Luca Dellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Consistent with what the Commissioner just said about uh, the trend in certain um, areas, uh, specifically mandatory breach notification, uh, we are seeing an increase uh, across the country in uh, requirements on the part of public bodies, public sector institutions, to conduct what are called privacy impact assessments, or PIAs, when a program activity or information system involving personal information is being created or amended. 
Uh, as the commissioner said in her submission, she's asking that uh, you recommend that Bill 29 include such a requirement, which I might add is found, for example, in British Columbia and so on. Uh, and essentially a PIA is a business risk assessment tool that allows uh, privacy to be designed in at the outset, not bolted on after. It allows some programs to be identified that shouldn't proceed because of the privacy risks involved, uh, but they certainly allow uh, for privacy to be designed in uh, so that uh, com compliance with the legislation is achieved and also appropriate policy is put into action. Uh, the Alberta Health Information Act requirement for PIAs uh, is one model uh, that could be considered, uh, as is the BC model, uh, and those are dealt with at greater length in the, in the written submission, but that's the, the, the recommendation of the Commissioner is that this be included in the legislation as well. Thank you. So, Luca Dallas, Madam Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and this is the final topic I will be covering. Um, this is not a subject that I addressed in my 2015 submissions to the Department of Justice uh, prior to the drafting of this legislation. But with the end of my mandate as Information and Privacy Commissioner coming at the end of October 2020, it has been higher on my mind in recent months, uh, and that's the remuneration uh, to be set for the, information, the next Information and Privacy Commissioner. It is important as an independent officer that issues such as remuneration are standardized for a number of reasons. When I started my mandate 20 years ago or more, uh, this was very much a part-time position and the lever level of expertise required to do the job was definitely less than it is now. It is now very much a position that requires full-time commitment and Incumbents very much need a high level of expertise, both in access and privacy law. It should not be left to the next Information and Privacy Commissioner to have to convince the powers that be what the appropriate level of remuneration for the position should be. Further, in order to, att in order to attract the right candidates, the Information and Privacy Commissioner should be able to count on having a pension as well as health and other benefits afforded to uh, those who work in the public service. I very much like the Saskatchewan approach, uh, which includes at Section 40 of their Act a provision that provides that the salary of the Information and Privacy Commissioner is equal to the average salary of all Deputy Ministers and Assistant Deputy Ministers of the Government calculated as of April 1st in each year. The same provision provides that the Information and Privacy Commissioner is entitled to participate in the Public Service Pension Plan and to receive benefits, the, the benefits of a government employee. BC also has provisions in its access and privacy legislation which sets the remuneration of the Information and Privacy Commissioner as the equivalent that, to that of the Chief Provincial Court Judge. The point is that remuneration should be standardized legislatively at a level that respects the importance of the position and will attract candidates with the requisite level of, of experience and and expertise and avoid the necessity of the person in the position having to negotiate that remuneration. So just as a final comment uh, before I cede the, f cede the floor, this may be a good time in light of recent developments in BC to suggest perhaps tongue in cheek, perhaps not, that the administrative records of the Legislative Assembly should become subject to the ATIP Act. I'll leave that one right there without further comment. In closing, uh, my written submissions, which you all have, uh, provide additional detail and additional comment about various parts of the bill. I have not commented on every aspect of the, legis uh, of the legislation, but would ha be happy to answer any questions about any of the pros proposed amendments. And I would like to uh, just end by thanking Mr. Lucadellis for his help in this. I couldn't have done it in the time frame I had without some outside help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. And uh, normally we would uh, allow less time for a witness, but given your expertise with, with this file and the importance of this legislation, we did want to allow you the time to provide a full set of submissions, and we appreciate the uh, additional expertise of Mr. Luke Dellis. Uh, committee, I will allow 10 minutes of question each, but we'll only do one round of questions before we get back to our to the rest of our witnesses. So if members do have uh, questions, now's the time to ask them. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. I guess no lengthy speeches from me. I appreciate you presenting to us. I just have a few questions of clarification here. 
Uh, we were asked this uh, yesterday actually in Fort McPherson uh, and it relates to the municipalities becoming subject to ATIP. What, do you have an idea uh, of what type of requests municipalities receive around the country, the ones that are, are subject to such legislation and who is making these requests? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Luca Dellis. Uh, thank you, Member. Um, certainly my experience in British Columbia and from what I know of the situation in Ontario, uh, you will get everything from requests from one neighbour about who's complained about a perceived bylaw infraction. You, and you do get those kinds of requests. Uh, the identity of, by the way, anonymous complainants or confidential complaints is protected uh, and would be so. Uh, a lot of requests to do with development applications, uh, you know, certainly in an urban setting like Vancouver or Richmond. Uh, people trying to see um, records that have been provided to council in camera, for example, and again, there are protections for that. Uh, records related to the administration of the municipality, much as is the case, I'm sure, at the territorial level here. So it really runs the range of corporate activities. Thank you, Mr. Lucadels. I'm, I'm hearing some uh, cell phone noises, so if everyone can make sure their cell phones are switched to vibrate or silent. Thank you. Mr. Simpson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. And and if you have any insight in particular about what very small communities, uh, what kind of requests they would receive, because in the territory, I think the average size of many communities is about 200, 200 people, so we're, we're quite unique in that sense. Uh, if I get some more insight, if not, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Lucadellis. I think it, it, in the smaller communities, um, the experience in BC certainly has been they don't get a lot of requests, frankly. Uh, but I think the trend in local government, as in other kinds of government, has been to proactively disclose more information. The council minutes are on the web, and that, even in smaller communities, the, you're finding that that's happening, and that may have something to do with it. But I can't really add anything to the detail in terms of the types of requests. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know the, the concern is that. Um, their, their record systems aren't quite up to date and there might be a few boxes over here, a few bo like unlabeled boxes as uh, the Commissioner mentioned. So uh, it will take some time uh, for them to get everything in order. Um, there was, uh, the Commissioner made comments about 22-2 uh, uh, and I think it was about peer reviewed, she said it was aimed at peer reviewed, peer performance reviews I suppose. And I'm not very familiar with this but uh, what the commissioner is suggesting is to uh, allow access to, allow someone to, to find out who said what about them. Now, my, I guess my question is, uh, is, is this a problem now that has been identified that, uh, um, then that's why you want it addressed? Is it something that people have been coming to you about or is across Canada, is it a known issue? Thanks, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the issue arises more in the context of workplace investigations uh, than in peer-to-peer -peer reviews. Um, in fact, I don't think I've received a, a request that deals with a peer-to-peer -peer review, but I think that's a fairly new development, uh, and I'm not terribly familiar with them. Um, but, um, yeah, a lot of the requests I receive are um, from employees who have um, been involved in some sort of workplace investigation, be it as a complainant or as an applicant, and they want to know what's been said and how the investigator uh, came to the conclusions that they came and what that conclusion was based on and uh, who was the one who gave, you know, who was the one who provided the information upon which the investigation was uh, grounded. So, uh, yeah, we get a lot of that. I get a lot of that kind of request. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. And uh, you're, you're not concerned about a ch the chilling effect that this might have, that uh, complaints might just go unheard. People won't complain if they know that their, their complaints, people will find out essentially. Uh, and perhaps uh, Mr. Lucadellis, sorry if I got the name, uh, Luca Dallas uh, has, has insight into that as well uh, in his experience. Thank you, Mr. Ch Chair. We'll hear from the Commissioner, then Mr. Luca Dallas. Madam uh, Commissioner. I'll, 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 I'll answer quickly on that one um, because I, this, this has been an ongoing battle, I think, between me and, and human resources people. That's their argument, that, that if, if you don't allow them to make anonymous complaints, um, then people just won't come forward. Um, from a fairness perspective, in my opinion, and it may be the lawyer in me talking here, 
Um, if someone is going to make, and I think about how I would react if I found out that a complaint had been made about me, but I couldn't find out who made it or what the details of that complaint were, I'd be really upset. And I understand that. It's the fairness thing. Because it's going to affect my income and my livelihood, whereas the person who made the complaint is off scot free and, and, and able to make any sort of allegation without having to back it up. So in my opinion, it's, as, I, as I said in my comments, it's more about fairness. Uh, I think the fairness aspect is more important in that circumstance than maybe the privacy issue. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Mr. Luca Dellis. Uh, the approach in BC, Alberta, um, and other jurisdictions is not, uh, Ontario being an exception, where there is a bit of a carve out for labor relations information, but the approach has been not to carve out all information involved in these kinds of processes because these proposed provisions, 24.1 and 24.2, would require a public body to refuse to disclose all information created or gathered in the course of such a process. No harms test, no question about you know balancing the rights of a complainant against those of a, an accused, if you will. Um, the approach in these other jurisdictions is uh, to treat these um, under the ordinary provisions that deal with disclosure of information that might unreasonably invade personal privacy. So you get a case-by-case -case balancing with guidance having been developed over the course of years in British Columbia. But again, it's not a, a class exclusion that just takes it right out of the legislation. Um, I'm aware of no evidence. Uh, I'm not a human resource pr professional. I haven't spoken to any of them about them, but I'm not aware of any evidence that there's been a chilling effect on people asserting the rights in the workplace where they've been harassed. And one could argue that uh, these days that's unlikely and certainly would hope not. Mr. Luke Dallas, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. I just have a couple more questions. Uh, you know, when uh, there's the, uh, the commissioner spoke about the Newfoundland and Labrador model where uh, the recommendations are made by the privacy commissioner and if the public body wants to reject those, they, they essentially must go to the courts and ask the courts if, if they can. And uh, I was wondering if and I think this would probably be a good provision. I think I don't like sending things to the courts. I like to, if we send things to the courts, if we create legislation that ends up in the courts or you know makes the courts busier, I think we failed as legislators. But I think that what this would do would probably make governments uh, a little more open to um, to accepting recommendations and uh, not, not being so private and, and realizing that it, it's fine if they're not. Uh, so I don't think a lot would end up in the courts. But do you know what kind of uh, caseload this has added? to the courts in Newfoundland? Uh, has it been much? Madam Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In fact, in Newfoundland, um, the, uh, the number of matters from the Information and Privacy Commissioners going to court has decreased significantly, um, uh, simply because the, the way their old uh, provisions were set up, uh, there, there was a lot of litigation an awful lot of litigation. Um, and uh, Mr. Malloy is, is qu uh, quite pleased, frankly, with, with the uh, new provisions and the way they're, they've been working. And um, like I say, four or five in, in the last four years, uh, are, are you know, maybe one a year, has ended up in court. So he's, he's very happy with the way it's working. And it has decreased his, uh, his legal budget significantly. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. That's good to hear. Uh, can I ask the chair how much time I have left? Okay. Um, so the privacy impact assessments, that provision exists in the Health Information Act. Uh, it doesn't appear to have the teeth it, it needs. Uh, when uh, the Health and Social, when the Department of Health amalgamated five regional health authorities into a single health authority, that wasn't enough to trigger a privacy impact assessment. And so there seems to be uh, some... Um, the legislation might not be drafted in a way that it, it, it's powerful enough or it's, it's, uh, it defines when an uh, impact assessment is needed. So do you have recommendations on how such an amendment could be drafted to avoid the, the shortfalls of the uh, Health Information Act? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Commissioner. Thank you. I think I'm going to ask Mr. Luca Dellis to uh, talk a little bit about the way Alberta is, is, works. Mr. Luca Dellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Alberta Health Information Act requires any health information custodian, and that can include a physician or another private sector health organization, not just the ministry or Alberta Health Services, to perform a privacy impact assessment. No guidance is given on what kind of form should be used, what the approach is. Any time that there's a proposed new uh, activity or information system, 
Um, and those are submitted to the Information and Privacy Commission in Alberta for comment. They don't bless them formally. They're not formally approved, but they are uh, provided for comment, and they have to, you know, you can't proceed without that. And so that gives you quite a quite a strong uh, incentive, obviously, to get them completed. There are hundreds a year, um, certainly in a province the size of Alberta. And in British Columbia, um, Section 69 of the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act has, has a model, has language that could be adapted. Requiring a privacy impact assessment anytime any public body in the province uh, proposes to undertake a uh, program or activity or to amend a program or activity that involves personal information. And in certain cases, commonly integrated programs, for example, they have to be provided to the Information and Privacy Commissioner for, for comment. Thank you, Mr. Lucadellis. Mr. Simpson, your time's expired. We'll go to Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and Thanks for your uh, dedication. It took us a little more than an hour, so I can see you put some thought into that. It was very, uh, it was very, uh, I would say, um, passionate about you to reach out to Mr. Lucadellis to deliver some additional help that you need to clarify to make sure that the uh, presentation is accurate. We, we heard from one of the uh, communities about the implementation plan. What's your thoughts on the implementation plan? You had mentioned that in your presentation. Should one be included? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Commissioner. We're, we're talking about four municipalities. Mr. McNeely, clarification. Uh, the implementation plan to the, to the amendments of the legislation, assuming it all goes through, and your recommendations on the, impl on the amendments as well. After the new act, the a new amendment act is finalized and assented, should there be a implementation plan okay. within that? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. McNeely, Madam Commissioner. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for for the most part, um, I see no reason not uh, not to have immediate implementation, um, except with respect to municipalities. And for mun municipalities, um, there's going to have to be some sort of plan. And, and I, I'm fairly certain um, that that's already been worked on, being worked on. I don't know what the details are, um, but there are there are a number of things that ha will have to be done. Um, and and in some cases, um, I'm thinking, if, for example, with respect to historical searches for access to information, um, perhaps uh, a plan, the plan should be that in municipalities of less than a certain number of people that <coughs> historical searches won't be allowed and that only prospective or, or from the date of, of the implementation should be allowed for access to information. Um, there's got to have to be training done, uh, and, and that's going to take some time. Um, there should be policies developed, probably. I, I, I don't see why one set of policies can't be um, a, a, at least drafted for all municipalities and let them change them as needed to suit their responsibilities. But yeah, there's a lot of work to be done ahead of that game. Um, and I would say at least a year for the larger communities, probably longer than that for the smaller communities and, and, and those who have uh, challenges such as, as um, you know, a lack of a file management system. Um, so yeah, should there be a plan? Absolutely. For municipalities, I think that's going to be a necessary. Uh, what that looks like, I could, I, I have all sorts of ideas on how, uh, what that might look like. Um, but uh, I'm sure that there have been discussions already along those lines. Mr. McNeely. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> yes. Um, my uh, next question is um, similar to my colleague, uh, Mr. Simpson, here on 24.2. Would it be um, equivalent to say that your concern to 24.2 is similar to the WSCC for worksite investigation? I'm thinking, as an individual, why should I ac access your office support for 22.4 when I can probably go over to the, I'm still the old fashioned, I say WCB's office for assistance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Commissioner. 
I'm not sure that those are comparable. Right now, uh, Section 23 right now, that's the section that says that uh, public bodies cannot disclose personal information um, about a third party where that disclosure would result in an unreasonable invasion of privacy. What I'm saying is that provision as it now exists is probably sufficient, is, is sufficient, I won't say probably sufficient, it is sufficient to deal with those situations in which there's been a workplace investigation and two parties in that workplace are uh, involved. I, I, like I say, I, this is one of the things that I deal with most commonly and in most circumstances, uh, in the end, uh, the parties get most of what they're looking for. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure how, um, you know, what the, the difference is between the w, uh, WSCC and the ATIP process is that you could compare. Um, but I, I, th I think that the sections that exist are protective enough of personal information that you don't need Section 24 point, 24.2 or 24.1. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Ms. McNeely? Uh, thanks for that reply. Um, I'm going to be uh, placing that forward to our research to get uh, those two comparisons along with OH&S to see if there is some similarity in both pieces of legislation. So I, I, I thank you for your clarification to that. Thank you. Not, nothing further. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Mr. Riley, you have the floor. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks very much for your report. Um, there's lots of great practical suggestions on how the bill could be improved to reflect state of the art and how we should be doing this in uh, the Northwest Territories based on experience in other jurisdictions, so I really appreciate that. Uh, one of the questions I have is um, Section um, uh, 39 of the bill would create a new section of the act. Uh, there would be a, I'll just read this out, this act must be reviewed by the minister within seven years after this section coming into force and after that no later than seven years after the completion of the, the previous review. I'm a little bit troubled that it would be the minister carrying out the review. The minister could pick up the act and said, I reviewed it, nothing needs to change. Uh, I'm curious about your views about how this review um, could or should be conducted. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Madam Commissioner. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, not ever having worked in government, I'm not sure how these things normally work, and I'll start with that. Um, when I hear the minister, uh, when I read this, I, I read it, the department shall do a review. I don't know. Um, Mr. Lucadellis may be able to shed more light on that. Um, I'm more concerned that the review is done. This is 23 years that we, and our first uh, large review of the Act. I don't want to wait another 23 years. Dallas? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll bring up British Columbia again because that's where my experience largely is. In British Columbia, the legislation there requires uh, a statutory review every six years by an all-party committee of the legislature. Of course, there they have parties, but uh, and that's done through public hearings such as you've conducted. A report is then made to government, and government will take up their recommendations or not. Mr. O'Reilly? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks for that. That's why, where I would want to go with this, leaving it to the discretion of a minister. The previous ministers have had 24 years to review this and nothing's happened, quite frankly, other than some consequential changes. Um, so, yeah, I, and I know that, you know, I'll use the uh, Official Languages Act. I think there's some other um, uh, acts that we have in place that require, um, uh, there's a statutory requirement for a public review by a standing committee, and that's, uh, I think, we're, what I'm going to be suggesting to the, this committee. So, um, I, my colleague had asked some questions about the privacy impact assessment provisions, um, or well, there are none in here, and uh, um, I think you've raised examples of how this is uh, done in Alberta and uh, British Columbia, 
Um, I'm just wondering, uh, and I think in your written submission, you said that you didn't really see any role for yourself as a commissioner in, in that process, but um, would it be advisable that the, the commissioner could or should recommend that there be a privacy impact uh, assessment on uh, um, a program or, or an activity or uh, where personal information is kept or held or changed in some way? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Madam Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The problem is, is I don't know when these programs are being implemented. Um, and, and, and I should say, to be fair, more and more often uh, in this jurisdiction, uh, departments are conducting PIAs prior to significant... I, I know they're being done. I never see them, or I rarely see them, um, but there's no requirement for me to see them. Um, I don't think that my submission said that I have no role. Um, I think I should have a role in that they should be reviewed by my office. My office can always give, uh, I'm not suggesting that my office approve them, um, but a review by the Information and Privacy Commission or someone who has uh, experience and expertise in the area um, will often uh, raise issues that um, that weren't considered or weren't thought about or have been poorly dealt with within a PIA. Uh, the Information and Privacy Commission can then report back to the department and say these are the things I think you should look at before you proceed. Due diligence is done at that point and it's then up to the department or the organization to, to do with that what they will. Mr. Riley. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I would hope that there'd be some role for the, the commissioner in um, reviewing privacy impact assessments or recommending that they be done or whatever. Um, I'm just wondering if I could ask your, your colleague uh, um, what sort of, if there's provisions in Alberta or British Columbia for uh, the, the uh, information or privacy commissioner in those jurisdictions to uh, recommend or suggest, or I wouldn't want to go as far as compel, but uh, uh, that a, a privacy impact assessment be done. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Lugadellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in Alberta, under the Health Information Act, um, that's the one of the three pieces of privacy legislation in Alberta that requires that they be done for new or significantly amended activities or, or um, uh, information systems, and that they must be provided to the commissioner. Um, and in British Columbia, where uh, it's a common or integrated program that's being assessed through a PIA, that has to go to the commissioner. Um, at the provincial level, where there's a data linking initiative that's being covered by a PIA, that has to go to the uh, commissioner as well. And for provincial government ministries, I ought to have uh, said all PIAs done by a provincial government ministry must be submitted to the minister responsible for the act, which has the centralized government expertise, but not on to the commissioner. So there's a bit of a filtering mechanism there. So all PIAs go to the minister and staff in that department provide value-added feedback. And then in those more, if you will, significant cases that go to the commissioner, uh, there's that added value as well. Mr. Riley. Uh, okay, thanks. That's uh, uh, helpful. Um, I'd like to ask the, the commissioner, um, if you could only get one or two changes, <laughs> what would they be? Thanks. Madam Commissioner. Uh, the, um, as I said uh, last week, um, the uh, breach notification would be number one, um, and the requirement to do PIAs would be number two. Um, I think both of those are, are, are really important um, to bring this act into the 21st century. Um, and, and to make it, you know, undoubtedly, those provisions would make the Northwest Territories legislation a leader. Uh, but there's nothing saying we can't lead. Um, so I, I would really like to see both of those. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks. Um, well, that's really helpful on the privacy side, access to information side. I think I know what you're going to say, but uh, if there's one or two changes you'd like to see on the access side, what would those be? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Madam Commissioner. That's actually a little more difficult. Um, 
I, I, one of the things I'd like to see changed is the um, the time for a review um, that that has been reduced from 180 days to um, 60 days. I, that that's going to be an impossible feat. It's not going to happen. Um, and you're setting the information of privacy commissioner up for failure. Um, then that leads to um, court challenges about whether the information and privacy commissioner has jurisdiction to complete the review and that sort of thing. Um, that's an important change I'd like to see to Bill 29. Um, the, the, the other provisions that I would really like to see gone, um, frankly, are the 24-1 and 24 -2, um, which I, I just don't think they're necessary to achieve what is already to, to achieve I don't understand what they're intended to achieve that isn't already in the act Mr. Riley last question uh, thanks I, I was hoping too that you were going to say the, uh, the the Newfoundland and Labrador um, uh, way of shifting the, the onus uh, uh, on the recommendations um, to uh, uh, the government, if they, they can't, if a government agency can't accept them, then or doesn't want to accept them, they'd have to go to court. Is, is that something that you'd really like to see changed or uh, amended in, in the bill as well? It's in your submission, but how strongly do you feel about that one? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Madam Commissioner. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's important. It's, it's going to become more important um, over time. Uh, like I said, it, you know, it, it used to be that all of my recommendations were pretty much accepted. And, and, and I see a trend that that's not happening anymore. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. That would probably be one of my number one. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Mr. Riley, your time's expired. On behalf of the committee, we would like to recognize your uh, incredible service in your role as commissioner and uh, your very thorough submissions to the committee. We will take it into full consideration. Thank you very much for your evidence. You're excused. You may have a short close. It'll yes. be just short. I just want to thank the committee and all of the audience for their indulgence because I know I took way more time than you were expecting. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Uh, next on our witness list are representatives of the City of Yellowknife. I see Her Worship, Mayor Alti. And this Sheila Bassi Kellett. SAO. Who will be speaking first? Uh, yeah. Mayor Alti. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just procedurally, we have uh, our presentation and we can speak to both um, bills at the same time. Would that work or would you like us to put a pause before moving into 911? I th yeah, I, th I think. Put a pause? Yeah, we'll put a pause. If you Kay. could just deal with your ATIP submissions and um, we'll take. Uh, if 15 minutes is ideal, but you have half an hour if you need it. Okay. I should be good. Yeah. Um, so good evening, Chairman and Committee members. On behalf of the City of Yellowknife, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before the Standing Committee tonight. It's a pleasure and an honour. I'm joined here uh, by Ms. Sheila bassi Kellett, who's the Senior Administrative Officer with the City of Yellowknife. Um, so I'm pleased to represent the City of Yellowknife and sharing our perspective on the bills currently before Committee. This is the first opportunity that we've been invited to engage or see the proposed legislative amendments to ATIP, as well as the draft bill for 911. In the spirit of partnership, we always appreciate being meaningfully engaged on issues that affect us and encourage the GNWT to work with us sooner rather than later in the preparation of legislative proposals and legislation that impacts community governments. As direct stakeholders, we have a lot of value to add. My uh, remarks will initially focus on the effects of the proposed amendments to the Access to Information and Privacy or um, Protection of Privacy Act. Um, following that, we'll speak on 911. So, Bill 29, an act to amend the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy, ATIP. So, openness and transparency are the cornerstones of good government, and discussion about the access to public records and protection of personal information are often at the forefront of public debate. The City of Yellowknife supports and encourages practices, policies, and legislation that provide the public with the appropriate tools to hold municipal governments accountable for their decisions. Governance and decision-making at the municipal level 
is more transparent than at other orders of government as defined in our governing legislation. When determining the framework for access to information and appropriately upholding privacy, the territorial government must give consideration to the size and capacity of municipal governments, as well as the cost relative to the benefits. So our current status. Although the ter territorial ATIP has not yet applied to the city or any other municipality uh, in the Northwest Territories, we are governed by federal access and privacy legislation, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, PEPIDA. In practice, we've developed systems and procedures in the interest of increased transparency and accountability, including providing broad access to information and engaging and informing the public. In addition, we consider every request for information and privacy issue in accordance with PEPIDA and also the purpose and principles outlined in the current territorial uh, privacy legislation. The proposed amendment to include municipalities under ATIP builds on a tradition of openness in municipal government. Municipalities in the NWT have a long history of governing and making decisions at meetings that are open to the public. The federal and provincial governments have executive councils, which meet in private and have significant executive decision-making authority. Municipalities, however, have the most open decision-making process of three orders of government in Canada. Municipal councils are permitted to hold private meetings, but only in relation to very specific matters that require confidentiality. As municipal officials, we recognize that the work of municipalities impacts the daily lives of citizens, so it's important to make information readily available to the public. Many of our municipalities are already doing an excellent job of providing access to municipal records, as well as providing municipal information online. In recent years, websites have become more prevalent tools of open communication, less expensive to develop, and easier to update. This has contributed to the growing amount of municipal information available on municipal websites. However, the workload and competing priorities in some municipal offices continues to be an obstacle to keeping information online current. I'd like to address the proposed amendments regarding the role of the Information and Privacy Commissioner next. Amendments to the Act propose to update the general role of the Information and Privacy Commissioner and expand the ability of the Information and Privacy Commissioner from performing reviews and making recommendations based on a request from the public to initiating reviews related to a privacy breach without receipt of a formal complaint. It's the City's position that the duties of the Information and Privacy Commissioner should remain at arm's length and investigative role until such time as the effect of the application of the Act to municipalities can be assessed, specifically whether the Information and Privacy Commissioner is faced with an increase in volume of complaints. In regards to resources, the amendments introduce many changes that affect municipal governance and administration. Imposing the Act on municipalities could represent a significant cost and administrative burden to municipal governments that already suffer from a lack of resources, including underfunding by the GNWT as per your own methodology, um, with the City of Yellowknife underfunded by $11.45 million, which includes just over 900000 in operations and uh, maintenance underfunding. Um, so again, with the eight um, recommendations in ATIP, it's that somebody be appointed as a coordinator. The current workload at the city would require an extra position. Um, again, we're underfunded already by over $900,000, so that would cr create a bit more burden on the taxpayers. Frankly, the city of Yellowknife, the largest municipal government in the ter territory, thereby appearing to have the internal expertise needed for administration of the Act, is concerned about the capacity required to address the volume of access requests, especially in light of the proposed amendments to reduce timelines. Records management is an area that many municipalities have not had the capacity to comprehensively and proactively manage. While we are all working to enhance our capacity, support will be needed to enable a systematic approach to ensuring that municipalities are able to respond to ATIP requests. The Act will require the City, Section 68.1, to designate a coordinator to receive and process requests, coordinate responses, communicate with applicants and third parties, and track requests and outcomes. The designated staff person will have to make a determination as to whether information can be released under the law and what information is protected. Furthermore, requests for information may involve third, party, third parties that have to be consulted. This can result in a process that's more time consuming, which must be balanced with other, other municipal pressures and priorities. 
We would suggest that fulsome analysis be undertaken by the GNWT to identify the process flow differences between PEPIDA, which we're currently under, and the ATIP, as they apply to municipalities, to fully comprehend the impacts that we could be facing. If the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act is amended to include municipalities, it's imperative that te the territorial government provide appropriate financial, records management, and training resources to municipalities. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Madam Mayor, do committee members have any questions for witnesses? Mr. Simpson. Thank you very much. And I just want to make clear uh, something that was said. Uh, uh, the mayor said that uh, municipalities are underfunded by the GNWT according to your own methodology. Uh, referring to us as the GNWT, we are not the government. We are representatives of the people. I always make that clear because, uh, not, not that I don't want to take the blame, I just want to point out that who we're on the side for. We're not defending departments. We are uh, trying to figure out what's best for the people of the territory. Um, when we were in uh, Inuvik, we, one of our witnesses was the president of the NWT Association of Communities. And uh, you mentioned that there wasn't consultation about uh, the development of this legislation, but from our discussion, I was under the impression that MACA had been in discussions with uh, the NWTAC, and uh, the, the NWTAC passed a resolution, and uh, the government responded, uh, a couple of responses actually, and the, the president seemed uh, confident that uh, MACA was willing to work with municipalities, and so, uh, I was just, I guess, wondering what was Yellowknife's uh, role in that consultation? And I know the NWTAC has its own, uh, there, there, there might be divisions between the smaller communities and, and the bigger centres, but uh, it's my understanding that all the communities are involved. So what was Yellowknife's role in those consultations? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, as one of the largest municipalities who will be one of the the municipalities that I think will be um, impacted by this legislation the most, uh, we would have appreciated the opportunity to be engaged directly. We did have that opportunity through the NWTAC, but um, as, again, one of the biggest municipalities that will be impacted, uh, we would have appreciated the direct consultation. Thank you. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. That's fair enough. Um, and so you, you stated that, uh, you know, I understand the, uh, the challenges here. We, we spoke with uh, regional centers, we spoke with small communities, and uh, you know we're, we're hearing from the city of Yellowknife now, and I understand the challenges that you're going to face. Um, I just want to be clear, you talk about uh, the fact that you will need assistance, probably financial assistance, maybe another person, you'll need training, um, but it also sounds like you're opposed to the legislation. So what is the stance of the city of Yellowknife? Is the city of Yellowknife opposed to including municipalities uh, in ATIP, or even if it's a, a staged uh, um, you know, it, it, it's rolled out over many years perhaps. Are you outright opposed to it or are you uh, willing to accept it but would like some assistance from, from the government of the Northwest Territories? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor. Thank you. And um, what I think is key is figuring out what the outcome is. So why are we including municipalities? What are we hoping to achieve? And is this the best result? So um, the request about taking a look at the, the difference between PEPIDA and ATIP to see the difference and the impacts. Um, we're currently governed under the federal legislation. How is the territorial legislation going to be different? What are you trying to achieve with this legislation? I think is one of the things that we're trying to understand. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. So you don't have a position of whether or not uh, you would prefer to see municipalities left out of ATIP or not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor. If it comes with the financial support, um, again, the legislation requires that somebody be appointed to the role. We currently don't have the resources at the city to have somebody doing ATIP off the corner of their desk. Um, so without we're already underfunded by the GNWT, um, so to compound that, it will be a difficult. Um, we'll always make it work, but um, it, it is a challenge, and we'd like to see the difference and what the GNWT is hoping to accomplish by having this legislation. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's yet to be seen, I guess, whether or not uh, the city of Yellowknife is either for or against this, and I, I understand, I mean, Everyone wants to be transparent, but you also have a job to do, and with the resources you have, you're struggling to, to do that as it is. So I, I understand your position. So uh, I'll let you off the hook, and maybe Mr. O'Reilly might pick it up. But uh, thank you for your answers. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Mr. McNeely. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for your presentation here. We heard a similar concern in, in, in the other communities that we uh, we held public meetings on is a lack of resources. If this is going to happen, we need more resources here to accommodate. So it was a uh, it was a common one, and my my question my question to to you as a municipality <coughs> is there are certain things that might happen. Some target dates here over the next couple of months. We're coming up to the uh, AGM for the uh, NWTAC. That's going to be the later part of or the last week of February. Uh, we're not too sure when this report is going to be. So there might be some things accomplished at the AGM. And I think the invitation by the minister has been extended. So I, I'm just saying that uh, these target dates could go along. Things might happen. And we'll, we'll see where we're at. But you might want to talk to your MLA to take 29 and uh, table it here in March after the AGM. Thank you. Madam Mayor, would you like to respond? No, appreciate the information and we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. McNeely? Nothing at this point in time. Mr. O'Reilly, you have the floor. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll probably push this a little bit more. I, uh, when I was on council, which is a long time ago, um, uh, I was a strong supporter of the application of uh, this legislation to uh, municipal governments and we uh, did we voted on it in council we brought forward a motion it went to NWTAC and it was it was passed by the NWTAC as well so um, I, I I understand that there's uh, a lack of resources in doing this um, I mean and I'm certainly not very happy that there doesn't seem to have been more extensive consultation with the city and or NWTAC in developing and rolling this out but um, I guess uh, I'd hope that the city would at least say look we support this in principle uh, we do want to uh, make sure that we have the resources to carry it out properly is, is that a would that be a fair position uh, that the city might take thanks mr. chair madam mayor if we are resourced properly it would be something that we would be supportive of but um, a lot of the legislation that comes forward if we take a look at cannabis is um, the city is now responsible for um, it, it's taken a lot of administrative resources uh, and and we aren't getting any revenue or um, from the GNWT to help in that regards um, so it's tough to say we're supportive of a tip um, when there's no resources being allocated right now for it so if resources financial and not just um, somebody at, with the GNWT that can answer our questions but somebody whose boots on the ground able to do the work is is accompanied with this legislation that that changes the conversation but um, from our perspective it's been this is going to be the legislation and we'll have to sort out how we resource it so I think from our experience um, we need to have legislation that has revenue tied to it to be supportive Mr. Riley uh, oh, thanks okay um, well, uh, that's something I think we'll have to look at pushing ourselves with uh, the minister and, and uh, the minister of MACA. And I think there's, there's probably some ways to accomplish this. Uh, I, I, I was curious about your remarks um, about the expanded role of the uh, Information and Privacy Commissioner. It almost sounded like um, you didn't really want the commissioner to have a role in um, access or privacy matters as they may relate to the the city if this legislation were to be passed um, am I characterizing that right or what were you really saying about the, the role of the, uh, the commissioner with regard to uh, application of the legislation to uh, city of Yellowknife thanks Mr. Chair Madam Mayor no sorry what I was saying was um the change from the commissioner performing and reviews and making recommendations based on um, being initiated by the public versus um, uh, initiating reviews without receipt of a formal complaint. Um, so by adding 
the extra duties of the municipalities, we may see an increase in volume of complaints. So just balancing that. Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so, okay, I just want to try to unwrap this a bit. So the concern is that the, the commissioner may not have enough resources to handle uh, complaints that might involve the city of Yellowknife or that the city of, of Yellowknife might not have the resources to interact with the uh, 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 commissioner uh, during her investigation of matters that she might, uh, the, the, the office might want to in, uh, initiate on their own. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor. A bit of both, yeah. Mr. O'Reilly. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I guess um, I'm going to push you a little bit, I think, on, uh, you know, you, you wanted to, ha to have some direct uh, consultation in uh, the uh, development of the legislation. Um, uh, if it were to be... Uh, um, brought into uh, or the municipalities were to be brought in under this is there a time frame that you would like what sort of resources would you need beyond uh, a one py what kind of training how might that be delivered you know school of community government already does a lot of training and so on um i i i, I you know look this is going to create more work for the city but it's also in the public interest, I would think, that you want to be able to be more open and accountable to, to the citizens of Yellowknife. So I think if you could, care, you know, uh, there's a lot of fear here about the unknown. There's always fear about the unknown. But if we can break this down and, and uh, be, uh, um, you know, what, is, what kind of support are you really looking for from, from MACA and what kind of resources is this going to take? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor. There's, yeah, besides the training and the resources, but it's also um, the getting all the documents into a format that would be easily accessible um, to hit the time frames that are being reduced uh, so that we actually have to respond faster. Um, so there is, we believe, a lot of, a lot of work to do. Um, to be prepared for this. And um, again, municipalities are one of the most open governments. Our meetings are broadcast on a webcast and um, our documents are available online. We're not able to hold private meetings like the executive council. Um, so it's just a case of making sure that we're able to um, be able to meet the timelines. And it would be tough to say, um, I don't know if we have uh, Ms. Basakelet time frames on implementation that would work. Um, thank you very much for this. We don't have time frames at this point. The uh, uh, we see certainly that, um, as Mayor Alti has said, we see implications for the city of Yellowknife that go, that go beyond a number of other communities. We know that the range of service that we provide, the number of bylaws that we have, are very extensive. We can see a lot of inquiries from developers, from a range of different clients that we have, being the largest community. Getting ready for that is not just having an access to information coordinator within the department, or within the city, forgive me. It's a very key part of this, but it's also training all of the staff who are uh, dealing with development permits, all of the staff that are dealing with bylaw enforcement, all the staff that are dealing with the different facets of the direct program delivery that we provide for residents of Yellowknife for the 20,000 people that are here that we would foresee that would have <coughs> many different kinds of questions that could be coming to us if ATIP were to be implemented. So there's a lot of training, a lot of understanding of what the scope is, as well as having the systems in place to be able to support us to be able to respond within the time frames that are laid out. Thank you. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks. No, I want to thank uh, uh, the folks from the city of Yellowknife. I, look, I, I used to work there uh, many years ago, and I understand the pressures that you folks are under. And uh, um, uh, I, you know, I think our our job is also going to be pushing MACA and uh, justice to get this right. And uh, uh, I don't really want to deal with this without an implementation plan as well. So I do want to thank our witnesses for appearing tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Uh, Mr. McNeely, I'll allow extra time. Go ahead. Extra time? I thought I had 10 minutes. 
Um, I'm, uh, my closing comment is more of a uh, comment by itself here to capture moving forward. Uh, my, my, my view of, of this legislation is modernization. Uh, there's a similar one coming up, and there's a new one coming up. So let's modernize it together. As the commissioner had mentioned, it took 23 years to get to this point, and there's lots of good thought given to her presentation. And she specializes in, in that area, so I'm going to really take her presentation to heart here, and uh, <coughs> and I look forward to discussing it with our colleagues. But at the same token, I realize that the city here is going to be the, the, the largest impact. It's similar to other communities in a lot of ways, so you got to factor in, as you mentioned, some of the some of the resources needed to cover staff, there's equipment, there's office space, there's the digital process of, of gathering all this information, not to mention the training. So if there's so much similarity in all these 33 communities, let's do it all together with committee and, uh, and through the NWT organization that covers all 33 communities. So considering all the sim similarities, I think we can modernize this and uh, face this challenge together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNeely. Madam Mayor, if you'd like to respond. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think just uh, the, the resources, the implementation plan, all that stuff, we just want to make sure that um, we're, we're consulted, we're working together to make sure that our feedback can be taken into consideration because I don't think it should be underestimated uh, appointing an ATIP coordinator um, Seventy-eight percent of our staff are frontline. That's lifeguards. That's firefighters. So it's um, we've got a very small administration, and they've got very specialized jobs. So making sure that we have um, the financial resources supporting this to make sure it's a success is going to be a key. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. McNeil, anything further? Uh, yes. Th thank you. I, I fully understand where you're coming from there, Mary Alty. You know, when I when I look at the uh, last two communities that I went to, um, and and I use that experience in Toledo, for example, providing um, providing vehicle registration assistance and asking for a driver's abstract. The material and equipment was at the end of, at the end of someone's desk. And somebody walks in requiring a driver's abstract. That's the, the the motor vehicles, if you want to call it office. So, um, so adding on to the municipality of say Toledo, for example, okay, well, they're going to need exactly what we're talking about. So I just share that with you. There's communities out there facing the same challenge. So I think we should face it all together. Modernization. Uh, of the, this ATIP together. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Uh, I have two questions. The first, um, the what we heard from the evidence we previously heard from the Information Privacy Commissioner uh, recommended at least a year for the City of Yellowknife in particular. Do you feel a year would be sufficient in working with? Um, not getting into a, a broader conversation about new financial resources, but if there was an implementation plan that spanned the course of a year, do you feel that would be sufficient to put the necessary things in place for the City of Yellowknife to be ready for an ATIP, to enter the ATIP regime? Madam Mayor. Uh, without the analysis between the differences between ATIP and Pepita, it'd be tough to tell right now. Um, so we would look forward to that analysis. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So tell me a bit about how PEPIDA rules work, um, because I, the, perhaps if we understood how you're currently operating, uh, we'd have a better sense of um, how that would impact ATIP. <coughs> if you're capable of doing that now, and if you need to, I see Ms. Penny's here, so if, if you need legal expertise, you're welcome to join the, the bench of witnesses, but Ms. Bassie Keller. Thank you very much, and, and I think that we could certainly provide information in more detail around this. We recognize that uh, between Ms. Penny and our city clerk, Debbie Gillard, there's a lot of information there in terms of how Pepita currently rolls out for us right now. We are in that sector that's identified as the mush sector, 
uh, by the federal government under PEPIDA, so it's municipalities, universities, schools and hospitals, all covered off by PEPIDA at this time. So we look at the spirit and intent of HIP overall when we do get requests. We have an internal protocol that we follow when people do come to us and ask us for information. We uh, look at following that legislation, but we do look at the spirit and intent of ATIP. If there was interest in seeing how we provide uh, and the, the kind of magnitude, we could certainly provide some information. But we honestly look at the GNWT to come and help us with this, to do this level of analysis. We can certainly look at what uh, and provide information on our workload right now under PEPIDA, but we would really like to have that analysis done, and we have asked for that from, uh, from GNWT. Thank you. Are there um, access provisions in PEPIDA, or is it just around the, the privacy protections? Ms. Bassikella? Mostly around privacy, thank you. Well, that was my expectation. I, yeah, and I think that's that will probably be the largest change for the city is to have citizens being able to have broader access. Um, so have you made a formal request to, the, to either the minister responsible for municipal and community affairs or departmental officials about this analysis? Uh, Mayor, Madam Mayor. It's been informal, um, conversational with staff. And yeah. the response so far? Still waiting. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further from me. If you'd like to provide any closing comments, you may do so, Madam Mayor. Uh, no, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You may be excused. Thank you, Madam uh, Ms. Sheila, Sheila Bassett-Kellett. Uh, next on the list, we have Mr. David Lacelsiu. Oh, okay, I'm doing better. Uh, Mr. Lacelsiu, how long is your presentation? How much time do you think you'll need? I'll try to be quick. Okay, um, I'm just noting the time. So what we'll do, committee, just because we've been at this for two hours and we do take breaks at that time, we'll allow the presentation to proceed, then we'll take a short break, and then uh, we'll come back and ask, ask any questions that committee members may want. If you want to take a break first. No, we'll, we'll get through the presentation. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My name is David Waseltsu. I'm uh, the chair of Open NWT. It's a nonprofit that focuses on open government and access uh, to government information and making it easier. Uh, I've done work on, on that initiative in the north and work with other uh, nonprofits around uh, Canada on more open government and more uh, accessible government. Um, my comments today are, are sort of representative of comments that we previously made to the Department of Justice on their public consultation um, and consistent with some of the work uh, happening elsewhere in Canada around modernizing ATIP legislation. Um, a number of my points um, were touched on by the, the Commissioner, so I, I won't uh, rehash many of those in, in much detail other than to, to support some changes. Well, first off, it's great that the new uh, the new legislation is coming. Uh, it's been 23 years. It's been talked about tonight. I would note that the first bill was uh, being considered in, uh, connected to the first bit of ombudsman legislation in the north. Uh, and since that legislation was finally introduced and passed a few months ago, it's great that ATIP is now being looked at again. Um, the expansion to uh, municipalities is sort of the first thing in the list of changes to the legislation is, is a, a great change. Um, it, it's a an important access to information provision change within the north. Obviously, it creates challenges for, for small municipalities and the larger ones, but it's really great to see that. Even understanding um, the hesitations that, that municipalities uh, and communities have, um, that there will be uh, burdened by a number of requests means that there's also a perception that there are a lot of um, people out there who want to know more information from municipalities. Um, and that, that alone makes it clearly more important that this legislation happen. Um, the idea of the phased approach that's been brought up tonight a number of times I think is, is a good one, but it also can't be stretched out too far. Um, something reasonable a year or two years, um, but if it becomes a four or five year rollout of legislation, um, frankly, um, this legislation won't be terribly effective. Um, so it's great to see that, and ideally there's some other tweaks that can be made to the legislation to make it more effective. Um, for one thing, uh, one of the other points that was made tonight um, by Mr. O'Reilly, uh, relation to the review of the Act, it would be nice to see that happen through the Legislative Assembly itself, through a, a committee of MLAs reviewing the bill rather than simply uh, departments. The bill has been reviewed many times over the last 23 years. There have been many comments um, from the Commissioner, and, and yet this is the first time serious amendments are, are coming forward. Um, some concerns around, around the legislation. Um, the clarification of types of records are, is, is important that are, that are accessible. Um, 
However, it's still not particularly specific. Um, the legislation, I think, really serves to two points. One is for interpretation by uh, the commissioner and by departments from a legal perspective, but it's also about people accessing government. People don't have the resources or understanding to sit down and go through the legislation in detail or call a lawyer and ask what, ask what everything means. So it's important that the legislation also be written as plain language as possible. Um, some jurisdictions, Newfoundland for one, is, has a very clear legislation as to what is included and what isn't included, um, but their bill is, is set in a very plain language method, which is great for the public. Since the bill is all about the public access in government, that sort of um, clarity, I think, is, is quite important. Um, the other piece that, that isn't touched on and has been brought up is, of course, the power of the commissioner to make uh, orders on, under the Act. Um, that isn't really addressed here. It would be um, really great to see that burden taken off the public. Um, the idea of the, the uh, I believe it's the Newfoundland model, um, where, frankly, the commissioner can make a binding order, and if the government wants to uh, challenge that, the government can, can have a, seek a judicial review. Um, that's a great model that takes the burden off the public. Um, it makes it more accessible and more possible, and, and frankly, sits on, on the government that has the resources and the abilities to uh, go to court, to, to have a decision reviewed. Um, it's simply a flipping of the current model, um, but it does certainly... Uh, add power to the commissioner, but also keeps that in check. You can't just uh, hand sort of unlimited power to, to an office, um, but that would be an easy way to keep that in check and, and expand it. One of the other pieces that wasn't in this bill um, was the adding of any proactive disclosure legislation or, or requirements. So right now, uh, the Government of the Northwest Territories um, proactively discloses quite a bit of information, be it procurement information, uh, travel, uh, all kinds of stuff, but that's not actually codified anywhere. It's been done for 15 or 20 years, but it's not in legislation, it's not in policy, it's not in regulation, it just happens. Uh, and it's great that it does, um, but at the same time, somebody tomorrow could decide they don't want to publish it anymore. Um, so it would be great to see uh, provisions in the Act added to require proactive disclosure of certain types and classes of information, um, even if it was simply uh, along the exact lines of what's already disclosed. Uh, and that's things like uh, the contract reports, the... Um, ministerial travel expenses, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and it's just happened for a number of years, but, but without provision. Um, additionally, the, the Act changes um, don't really speak to, to fees. Um, as much as that's in regulation, uh, you know, the trend within Canada is to lower the fees and, and to make it a more accessible project, uh, more accessible initiative to, to take on. Um, that being $25 by, by check or, or cash now is, is great, but the, I mean, the federal government's recently uh, lowered it to $5 and in their act uh, has eliminated all fees. Um, I, I think it's important to have a strike a balance there, but also for that to be, some of that to be in legislation and some of those controls, um, rather than simply leaving that all open to regulation and interpretation. Um, a couple of, of broad pieces. Uh, one, an expansion of the organizations covered under the, the Act. In reviewing the Commissioner's report from just this year, there was even debate um, with, a, a, depart with a, a Crown Corporation, an agency underneath it, about the applicability of whether or not they're covered. Uh, that shouldn't really be... I mean, the Act hasn't changed in 23 years. It shouldn't really be up for discussion about which public bodies are covered by the Act or not, uh, and perhaps uh, simply inclusion of a comprehensive list of the bodies that are covered uh, would be a much uh, simpler way of, of clarifying that, rather than leaving that to be something that goes for Commissioner review uh, later on. Um, further... Um, other acts, such as Newfoundland, I believe Ontario, and some other jurisdictions also guarantee the confidentiality of applicants. Our act doesn't speak to that in any way. Um, it, it's a small change and, and something that would generally be considered um, because it would be private information that didn't need to be shared, but having it stated directly in the act that an applicant, is, um, their name or the identity of the applicant is to be kept confidential. Um, you know, it is an important piece for the, for the public. Uh, again, it's small communities. So uh, the way it's, it's uh, enacted is that only the person receiving the ATIP requests obviously knows it, and that request is actioned within the department or the, the body, uh, but not necessarily who's asking uh, for it. Um, further, uh, Section 6 of the Act on how to make a request talks about written requests. Um, I don't personally know if written requests excludes electronic uh, requests, but it, it would be certainly nice to make sure there was explicit languages to eventually allow for submission of electronic uh, access to information requests and, and not have the, a uh, the Act um, exclude that sort of thing. Um, another piece uh, that isn't in, in the changes to the Act or in the Act is regular reporting by departments and 
and bodies based on the submission request on the access requests that have been made um, recently in the preparing for for this act actually uh, the Department of Justice did post some great summaries of the historical uses of the act over the last seven or eight years um, but it would be much simpler to include in the act a provision that required each department or or body covered by it to publish that every year and make that accessible via likely their website have it tabled in the house uh, or as part of their their business plan review or, or something along those lines um, one recommendation, another recommendation that I, I made before uh, to another committee related to the, the Elections Act, uh, and it, it came up as well earlier, is the remuneration and the overall job position of the Commissioner. Um, many legislative uh, appointment posts in the NWT are simply at the discretion of negotiation with the Board of Management. Um, I understand that, and that's been the provision for a while. M a lot of other jurisdictions tie key legislative, like key appointments of the, of the legislature, to various other positions. Whether it be an ADM salary or deputies or judge, um, that's normally sort of attached to something outside of it, outside of that provision. Um, for clarity, for sort of openness, uh, and for public accountability, I think that's an important piece. Uh, we haven't done that yet in any other legislation in the NWT, um, but since we only have three or four legislative officers, uh, it would be nice to perhaps start doing that uh, with the ATIP uh, commissioner. Um, just trying to, to zip through without taking too much extra time. Um, you know, in, in general, seeing this, the modernization of the Act is, is great um, and seeing some changes happen. Um, the, the changes proposed are, are certainly an improvement, but there's a lot more that can be done considering it's been so long and the chances are it will be quite some time before the, the Act is opened up again. While it's not within the body of the Act, um, but it would also be uh, great to see the Act and the application of access to information uh, modernized, and, and that be that is being put online. Um, if you're in a small community, uh, it can be difficult to file an access to information request. Uh, if you're in any community, it can be difficult to file an access to information request. You have to find the right government office. You have to get, get a hold of the right person and file it. Um, jurisdictions that have moved to being able to do an e-submission of the request um, or to simply fill out a form online, or not even send, out, send in the PDF, uh, it makes it easier, more accessible. The whole point of this is that access to information is something the public can use to access government information, and it needs to be an easy process to allow for that. Um, in some jurisdictions uh, uh, globally that have access to information pieces, um, there's even portals set up so that there's one place to go to that you can make an access request to any body that would be covered under it. So municipalities, whoever, there's one website you can go to, and that request can be made that way. You're not busy trying to hunt down any number of different websites or, or forms or, or anything else to access. Um, Improving upon that would be uh, fantastic. As well, a number of jurisdictions have started the practice of posting uh, and making available previously made submissions. Um, I know that the federal government has undertaken this, and there's some concern uh, due to language requirements, which we would face the same uh, challenges, but they've um, sort of found ways of dealing with that. Uh, a number of other jurisdictions, such as uh, Alberta, Newfoundland, um, Ontario is moving that way, are, are moving in the, in the direction of posting completed ATIPs um, for, for access to information, not personal information requests, of course, um, but just making them online, so previous requests. Um, these are records that are already created, they're already compiled, they've already been sent out. Um, the idea of putting them online and making them accessible just takes that same information and makes sure it's available publicly. They're, at that point, they're already screened public records, um, so there's not really any, any barrier. That doesn't need to necessarily need to be in the Act, but simply in the modernization and the practices of access to information in the territory. That would be uh, fantastic to see. Um, beyond that, I mean, uh, acknowledging the time and, and the extensive presentations uh, we've, we've heard tonight, um, I can leave my, my comments to that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Walsasu. Um, keep in mind, you can provide uh, written submissions if you haven't already yep. until tomorrow at 5 p.m. But if you need a bit more time, we'll probably <laughs> give it to you. But we will uh, we'll now just uh, take a, let's say, 10-minute break and uh, allow our sound technician to stretch his legs. And then we'll come back uh, and we'll, we'll require you to be here to answer any questions the committee has. And if there's no further submissions, and I don't think there are, we'll move on to the 911 legislation. Okay, committee, we are in recess.
Come back. Yeah, yeah, I'll be like a minute. I mean, you yeah, gotta have...
Okay, we'll call back to order. If everyone could take their seats, please. Okay, thank you. We'll resume where we left off. Committee, does anyone have questions for a witness? Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks. Uh, no, I want to thank uh, Mr. Wasilski for his comments. I, I do want to flag the uh, there were, I think, at least three items that you mentioned that were in the uh, the Information and Privacy Commissioner's um, submission, which you haven't seen the written version, but um, she did have uh, um, sections dealing with uh, what you call proactive disclosure, but I think she had a slightly different name for it. But uh, um, an expansion of ATIP to cover other bodies. I know that the the uh, commissioner had raised uh, the NWT Housing Corporation as another agency that should come under the the bill and uh, confidentiality confidentiality of applicants that was covered in her submission as well. So great when you're agreeing with the uh, the, the commissioner as well. So, but uh, no, I think you've made some uh, helpful suggestions and support many of the points made by the the commissioner as well. So. Appreciate your time. And if you want to put something in writing, I'd invite you to do that. But thank you. Would you like to respond, Mr. Wessels? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's it's good to note um, that so many of the comments were in the commission's report. Um, and, and just echoing them, I mean, it's all based on, frankly, best practice from around the country. Um, what we're doing now and some of the changes are a good step in that direction. Um, we just need to take a few more steps all at once. And if uh, MLAs have this one chance to consider changes to it, uh, it's important to get it right and, and put as much of that in there as possible, um, knowing that uh, this probably won't happen again for quite a number of years. Thank you. Mr. Riley, anything further? Thanks. Thank you. Mr. McNeely? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to thank you, David, there for your, your input. Everything, uh, everything you say, along with the other communities and, and what's said tonight, gives more information to the, uh, to the committee for the report. Thank you. Uh, similar. Uh, I'm happy to, to be able to. I wish there were more um, people of the members of the general public here to also give some feedback on how it's on how it's used. Um, as much as it applies to government bodies, it, it, the whole act is about people accessing government, um, and so it's uh, great that these suggestions line up well. And they're hopefully they're things that you can actually um, work with the government to to get enacted and get and change in the in the legislation. Thank you. Mr. McNeely, anything further? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, would, do you have any closing comments, Mr. Wiselsi? Uh, sure, just a second. Um, thank you very much, I mean, to the committee for having the, the hearing um, and all the discussion tonight that, that's been good. Uh, it's been really interesting to hear both committee's thoughts and the other organizations that have, that have spoke. Um, you know, there, there's a number of things that have come out of this, and I, I didn't speak to it, but uh, one, one item that, that had come up earlier was, was PIAs. Um, and I only want to mention it as somebody who has worn the hat of a, of a civil servant at different times in my career. Um, I mean, 10, 15 years ago when I worked with the Ontario government, it was regular practice. Everything we did, we ended up at the privacy commissioners just saying, hey, does this make sense? Um, and, and that's a good general practice. Um, you know, something that uh, it's nice to see happening a bit more here in the, in the Health Act and, and ideally eventually in, in just regular course of business. It's not something that even needs to be in the legislation, it just needs to be happening. Um, so there's, there's more of these things that hopefully, um, whether or not MLAs are able to add to the legislation, uh, a number of these pieces are just good practice, and hopefully MLAs can work with the government to make sure they actually just happen. Um, there's no need to wait um, for the next seven-year review for the government to do things better and for legislation to be uh, interpreted better. So uh, hopefully um, there are able to make, you are able to make a number of changes to the, to the legislation as it goes forward. Um, and notwithstanding that, that uh, you can also work with... Uh, with the minister and making sure that um, the way the act is actually implemented um, better serves the the people of the NWT. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You may be excused. Uh, we'll next call Sarah Brown to the witness table, representing the NWT Association of Communities. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Committee. Um, certainly appreciate um, the opportunity to speak to all of you, and I know that you spoke to our President, uh, Clarence, Councillor Clarence Wood, in Nanuvik, um on Tuesday. Um, so I'm not going to repeat what he said, but I'm going to highlight a few things for you, and I'll 
I'll pass this around. Um, Our clerk will just oh, okay, great. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I just wanted to point out that um, one of the things that was mentioned a little bit earlier was with respect to consultation on this act. Um, we were consulted back in 2015 was the last time we had any significant consultation on the issue of ATIP. Um, and that's when we crafted our resolution, which I know I know uh, our president uh, went through for you. Um, and we have had a couple of replies in uh, to that, which I also included in the the written submission. That it, if it is, if the proposed changes happen, but since this act has been crafted, we have had no consultation with either Justice or MACA. Um, we've had no discussions other than very informal ones with the department, but another, no formal consultation. They have uh, not come to our AGM. I have currently have no request relative to our AGM um, from either Justice or MACA on this file. Um, although we were prepared to entertain it, we are formalizing that agenda as we speak. Um, so um, very concerned if they meet the terms and conditions that have been in MACA's reply to us, um, on our resolution, then that that will be fine, but very concerned that um, we are going to have some issues around that. Um, they have not demonstrated consultation consultative behavior um, to date, and I'm we are definitely concerned that um, we and the communities need to be at the table designing the implementation um, and because it's only the communities that understand what their challenges are going to be. Um, and it's quite different from community to community. You can imagine Kakiza will have a difference, you know, with uh, two staff, I believe, are going to have a different set of issues than the city of Yellowknife, um, and also going to have a different volume and, and issues they need to consider. And so we, we need to make sure that all of the communities, and I think you had mentioned uh, earlier the using the AGM, well, the agenda is getting finalized right now, and we've had no request from either department relative to this file. So, um, we all support transparency, as was mentioned earlier. It's implicit in all the work that communities do. It is implicit in the acts that create them. That that transparency. So nobody is objecting on on that context. It's just we are currently underfunded to the tune of 37 percent. This is not we're underfunded by 5 or 10, 37%. That leaves no resilience, no additional capacity to take on new responsibilities without having the resources. And, and if we can you know, actively participate in identifying those costs, those sorts of things, again, as part of some sort of implementation, whether it's done through a regulation or an implementation committee uh, that provides advice we're not we don't want to presume how that might happen but that we really need to be at the table as that that implementation is being designed thank, thank you, you. Ms. Brown. thank you Ms. Brown committee do you have any do we have any questions for a witness yes Mr. O'Reilly uh, thanks uh, Mr. Chair yeah thanks for this I, I wasn't uh, in Anuvik so glad to get this uh, and uh, particularly the June 19th uh, update from GNWT is very helpful and giving us some leverage. Um, you mentioned the 37% uh, underfunding. Is that with regard to the municipal funding gap review? Ms. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's that's with, with respect to that review. Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, no further questions, but I appreciate you coming this evening and giving this to, to me. Thanks. Thank you. Anything further from the committee? <clears throat> Yes, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Uh, you know, what's going to come of this is we're going to write a report and we're going to make recommendations and uh, uh, they'll be voted on by the assembly. And I, do you have a, what would you like to see in, the, in those recommendations uh, concerning uh, consultation with communities? Is there anything, any specific words or phrases or, uh, or something like that? Uh, I know you said you didn't want to speak directly to the type of consultation, but uh, what do you have an idea of what would work best for the uh, the association? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I, I would recommend that we, we and we've done this for other work like the f the funding review, where we um, develop a working group 
um, and we try to get a good, we work with MACA usually to get a good cross section of uh, municipalities, uh, different structures, different types of municipalities, north to south, small to big, and have a nice robust cross section. And then, and then because we can't, it's hard to work with all 33. You can have them comment. All 33 provide comment on the, what the working group might come up with. But as far as actually designing a program, it's better to have a slightly smaller group. That's worked very well. Um, and I would recommend something like that, where that group comes up with a series of, of recommendations about rollout. Mr. Simpson. And thank you very much for that. And uh, it's hard to even sort of get to get specific questions, because speaking with the municipalities, they have such varied challenges, and there's so little information about you know what they would need to do. Um, I know one of the things that uh, was discussed was uh, right now, I think MACA has helped roll out uh, inventory uh, management system or as asset management system yeah. and uh, the, you know a records management system, another initiative like that I think is something that could be rolled out. Uh, has that been discussed by the mem by your membership? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not today, no. Um, uh, but I, I can tell you that the asset management rollout is is a big initiative, and it's taken a lot of effort. So again, yes, there's there's some synergies that could happen, and certainly things to be learned by having templates and uh, all those sorts of things. But um, and and you know, having somebody else research what's the most appropriate records management system, for example, um, which is exactly what happened with the asset management piece. But it still takes a lot of time um, to even do those supports for the communities. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you very much for that and I look forward to hearing what comes of, comes of the discussions at the AGM about uh, about possible implementation of this. Thank you. Ms. Brown, did you have anything for, further to that comment? D just wanted to say thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak to all of you and, uh, and uh, really appreciate it and uh, we, as I said, in, it's certainly done in the spirit of of, of uh, trying to be open and transparent, um, but that it comes with lots of burdens for the communities, and that just needs to be thought through. Thank you, Ms. Fred. Just before you leave, we have one more member who'd like to ask you some questions. Mr. Sure. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's not a, a question. It's just a uh, more of a summary of, of what all the presenters had mentioned so far here and what I had mentioned earlier. By working together, we can throw out suggestions that you're having your AGM on the on February the 28th, I think, I, I believe it is. So you might want to consider working with committee or working with all the stakeholders of, of your organizations to uh, see if this Bill 29 could be uh, moved in March mm -hmm. after the presenters mm -hmm. have done the report, including the discussions that's going to happen at your AGM. Mm -hmm. It's a suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Brown? Uh, thank you very much for the suggestion. Ms. Rick Daly? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, and I will say just uh, on, on behalf of the committee, based on um, our consultations this week um, on, on Bill 29, it's pretty clear the, the municipal question uh, is a significant challenge that we've heard from members of the public, and it is not, we, we don't take it lightly as a committee. Um, it's outside of our formal scope to amend the bill, but as the deputy chair pointed out we can make recommendations to government and make them and pass them to the house so uh, we will determine the best way forward on this but I can assure you we'll, we are is not our intention as a committee to leave our communities in the dark um, and under resourced when it comes to this important regime because if we do that then it, it really doesn't matter because citizens won't be able to access their personal information or ensure that their information is protected without the right resources in place so it is something that we take very seriously and thank you very much for your um, participation. Thank you. Anything further on Bill 29? Well, thank you very much to all of our witnesses who appeared to provide evidence for Bill 29. We will take that into consideration as we move forward and uh, write our both a, a substantive report, recommendations, and potential legislative amendments, and that will uh, take place in the February March sitting which starts very soon next we have bill um, 8 no bill 31 the Northwest Territories 911 Act uh, this one's a bit more straightforward the legislation proposes uh, to direct the Minister of Municipal and Community Affairs to establish a territorial 911 service 
and to mandate the participa participation of telecommunications carriers who will be required to comply with any prescribed registration and reporting requirements and to bill subscribers to collect the fee and remit it to the GNWT. Mandate the participation of local authorities and emergency service providers and establish a 911 cost recovery fee to be paid by local landline and wireless mobile subscribers and to be collected by telecommunication carriers. Um, so, although the legislation is fairly straightforward, create a 911 service and charge a fee for it, and to enable the government the authority to do that, the uh, practical implications of how it will affect communities and how it will affect residents are really what committee has been most focused on. Uh, so, we will turn over the floor to any witnesses who wish to provide submissions to 911. Uh, and first on our list is the City of Yellowknife, represented by Her Worship Mayor Alti. And Ms. Sheila bassey Kellett, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so Bill 31, the Northwest Territories 911 Act. Um, the City of Yellowknife commends the territorial government for contemplating Bill 31. Implementation of a 911 system quite simply saves lives. A 911 system achieves this by eliminating any doubt or delay regarding the correct number to call in an emergency. And I know we've heard some stories over the years of challenges that uh, it's come by having to know the various different emergency responders numbers. As tourism increases the number of visitors to our city, it's becoming increasingly more important to have a 911 system that is recognized by travelers worldwide to ensure that emergencies are reported in a timely manner to avoid adverse consequences. So the current status, the City of Yellowknife currently operates a dispatch service that receives emergency calls for fire, ambulance, and other emergency situations. The proposed Northwest Territories 911 Act will bind the participation of the Northwest, uh, the, sorry, the City of Yellowknife as a local authority. It's the City's position <clears throat> that the GNWT must undertake detailed consultation with the City of Yellowknife to ensure successful implementation of 911 services. <coughs> when it comes to costs, the City of, of Yellowknife has always expressed an interest in working with the GNWT, specifically Municipal and Community Affairs, towards implementing 911 services for our residents. However, having recognized that implementation of 911 service is a high priority, the costs associated with territory-wide coverage are significant, and the City has concerns about any increase of cost of living for our residents. It's the City's position that the GNWT must fund any costs incurred by the City of Yellowknife as a result of the transition to a 911 system, such as incremental costs incurred as a result of any necessary improvements to the Yellowknife Fire Dispatch as a result of implementation of territorial-wide 911, and telephone network costs that are not covered by 911 fees charged on a monthly phone bill. Um, just in conclusion, in the updated priorities of the 18th Legislative Assembly, the GND, GNWT commits to building stronger relationships with community governments and stakeholders. By adopting the amendments proposed in Bill 29 and Bill 31, members must ensure that the community governments which are most affected are consulted meaningfully and included throughout the process in accordance with this clearly stated priority. So again, we'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to meet with the Standing Committee on Government Operations tonight, and uh, welcome any questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify uh, something. So the Mayor stated that uh, the City of Yellowknife's position is that the GNWT should pay for any cost incurred by the City of Yellowknife, including the, um, the fee, the per phone fee, so the $2 a month or, or whatever it may be. Uh, is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, Mayor? No, sorry. Um, it's the result of the transition to the 911 system, so any incremental costs, but um, the actual monthly phone bill fees, no, those would go to the users. Mr. Simpson. Okay, yeah, and I mean the City of Yellowknife will have those fees as well for every phone they have. It's a, it's a $2 yeah. fee or whatever the fee may be. We don't know. No one knows for sure. I mean, it's, it's up in the air right now. Uh, well, sorry, sorry I'll, I'll, I'll let the Mayor respond. Madam Mayor? So, yeah, it would just be those startup costs to get the program running. Thank you. What sort of startup costs does the, the City foresee uh, with the transition to 911 if it happens? Thank you. Madam Mayor? If there's any cost between uh, requiring our dispatch to upgrade to be compatible with this GNWT, so um, not known right now, but that's where we'd want to make sure that consultation between the city and the GNWT is strong so that we can make sure that our 
our systems work together. Mr. Simpson. Um, no, that, I think that's all I had for now. Uh, maybe if we do another round, since we're, we're getting th th through things so quickly, I might have more questions, but that's it for now. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Simpson. Um, the, and just for the information of uh, people who are joining us today, our, and we don't know the exact costs, but our closest guess puts that around $2. And we're still waiting for more clarification from the department on what their expected costs are. Per month, per phone. Per month. So it's around the $2 range per month per phone. Um, so that's the user cost that we're talking about. Um, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I was trying to get a little bit more detail or a better understanding on your definition of incremental cost. Um, as our chair had mentioned, and we mentioned in the last several days there, we haven't had a briefing, so we're suspecting that the cost would be like, let's just pick a number and say a, a, a dollar fifty per month or two dollars per month. So you're saying that cost for your phones would be passed on? as identified as incremental cost. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor? It, the, uh, what we were talking about more is about the capital costs to set it up. Um, so making sure that the GNWT system and the City of Yellowknife systems work together. And if they don't work together, that the GNWT would support the city in paying for the upgrades so that the GNWT s system works with um, the cities. So we understand that we'd be responsible for paying our our monthly fees on the, our own phone bills, um, but it's those upfront costs, making sure that's included in the overall GNWT project costs. Mr. McNeely. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I still really don't uh, don't understand that, but that might 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 come with, with our briefing down the road. If you're identifying and passing the dollar on to to the next party here through this identification of incremental cost, well. Maybe that same cost might be brought up at the municipalities or some of the communities might uh, say, okay, we're going to do the same thing. Then it, it might become a, a larger issue, but we still don't identify the definition of incremental costs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor? Uh, maybe to give an example, the RCMP upgraded their system. Um, a few years ago and it no longer was compatible with the cities um, so we just want to make sure that when the GNWT implements their 911 services because 911 will be um, being put over to our dispatch to make sure that they can talk and if they can't that the GNWT includes that in their their total project costs so that was kind of the point that we were trying to reinforce. Mr. McNeely, clearer? Um, yes, if, if uh, it was brought up, and if you recall there a number of years ago, there were, everybody was getting charged for 911 service through Bell. And we, we haven't seen any installations of equipment to provide that service, but yet we were getting charged. So I, I give that as an example. I'm still trying to... I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a technician, so I'm still trying to get my head around of what's going to be needed to provide this. I mean, I can dial 911 right now, and it's probably going to go through. Is that just a communication uh, entry to the system with the already in place infrastructure that we have? If, 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 that, if it's that easily done by the communication server, I, I, I don't see any cost in that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. So just for clarification, Madam Mayor, I, I think the, what you're saying is that if you were required to put in new technology or hardware to uh, interact with the GNWT's call center in order to facilitate the provision, uh, those are the kind of costs you're, you're talking about. You're not interested in recouping the city's costs for paying the monthly fee. You're interested in any technology, hardware, equipment, phones, that kind of that kind of material is that correct, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. McNeely? Uh Nothing further. Uh, okay. We'll probably get and get that information down the road here. We we haven't had a briefing by the minister yet, so that's why we're in suspense on the rate, for example. No. Okay, thank you, Mr. McNeely. Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks. Um, I guess uh, I'm just uh, I'm a bit more than a bit perturbed that. <laughs> There hasn't been more discussions between uh, uh, 
municipal and community affairs and yourselves. Uh, um, so uh, it looks like if I were to believe this presentation that was uh, given to us uh, by our, the, the material that's uh, Maca put together the implementation date of this is July 1st of this year, which seems to be pretty quick. Um, so what happens? So on the implementation date, if I'm a resident of Yellowknife and I want to access emergency services, am I going to just phone 911, or am I going to phone uh, 1111 or 2222, or <laughs> well, what number am I going to call? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Madam Mayor? It's a great question that I, I'm reading this tonight and seeing that the awareness campaign is going to be this. Um, so that's kind of one of our, our big takeaways from tonight is that um, the city of Yellowknife, as other municipalities, should be consulted and not just um, here's the public uh, feedback form that you can fill out. We've got to really have those um, sit down and, and work out the details and, you know, this is our system and this is your system and this is how it works. Um, so there has been some informal discussions that have started at the staff level, but um, we just really want to make sure that all of this stuff is captured and that we're meaningfully engaged to um, just in our 20... 19 budget discussions. I know how much changing a little telephone network can cost. So they're not they're not small costs when you have a small tax base. Um, you know, 150,000, 300,000 just to change some phones can can be a big cost for residents of 20,000. So um, I'm just getting up to speed on this presentation as much as you are. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just before we go back to you, Mr. O'Reilly, um, do you are do you aware of the, the existing emergency numbers that the city operates? So the the two 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 has MACA given any indication what happens to that number after nine one one goes live? So is it being maintained? Is it because um, that's a question we had in other communities as well? What happens to the existing numbers? Can residents still call them? This is your new witness, I take it? Yeah. If you could introduce yourself for the record. Yes, my name is Doug Gillard. I'm the manager of emergency management with the city, and part of my responsibility is the city's dispatch center. Um, we had a meeting with a representative from MACA a couple weeks ago, and our understanding is that we will maintain and keep our emergency line. Um, it's been in place for many years. We want to make sure that people, if they're called 911, or they call our emergency line, they will get an answer. Uh, our emergency line is also there as a backup, in and all communities are going to be uh, required to keep their previous emergency lines, from what I understand, so that if 911 were to go down, um, uh, an alert would go out to people that 911's down, call your local number. So the local numbers will be maintained as far as the information I've received up to this date. Thank you, Mr. Gillard. Mr. O'Reilly, I have paused your time, and you may continue. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, you asked what I was going to ask. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, to me, it seems like we're going to have a lot of questions for the, the minister and the department on this uh, uh, in terms of the implementation of this. But I, I guess, um, you know, we heard from Ms. Brown that uh, NWTAC would, had suggested that there be some kind of a working group on... Uh, um, a tip uh, rollout with municipal governments is would that sort of approach would you folks like to be participating in that kind of an approach with the uh, rollout of 911 as well thanks mr. chair madam mayor a working group yeah um, or those direct staff to staff if the challenges um, whether it's a working group of cities towns and villages if they have common concerns and a working group with different um, communities or if it's a working group that's everybody together um, but I think um, there may be some opportunities if uh, to have one or two working groups Mr. O'Reilly uh, yeah thanks Mr. Chair um, yeah I, uh, that's very helpful and I appreciate the, the information the city's brought forward it, raises some serious questions, I guess, that the committee's going to have to look into. 
we get the minister in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, so just before we move on to the next person in the queue, uh, this presentation will tell you and any member of the public who reviews it, and it is available online, that the go-live date for 911 is uh, uh, scheduled for July 30th or June 30th? First, yeah. July. Yeah. So is the city prepared? Do you, does the city feel comfortable with that date, that they are, it is, in fact, prepared for that go-live date? Madam Mayor? Um, as we're just starting the discussions, we'll, we'll have to see if we're prepared or not, but um, we hope to stay in close contact to make sure that um, when the go-live dates launch that we're set to go. When was the last time city officials or city council had a conversation with the department or the minister on 911? I believe the last time they came was in 2017, and that's when... Um, the the consultant had recently proposed that Yellowknife may be the um, call center, and then uh, they haven't been back to council since then. Yeah. And have they been back? To, have they spoken to uh, on the officials level since since that date? Uh, uh, Ms. Bassey-Kellett will respond. Ms. Bassey-Kellett. Thank you very much. Yes, they, uh, the Department of Municipal and Community Affairs did confirm with us that they would not be utilizing the city, that they were going to go to a uh, GNWT retained model for the rollout of 911, and uh, they let us know that in early 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. I wanted to thank uh, the City of Yellowknife for, for providing us with this information. Uh, we've been trying to get it from the department, but we haven't been able to. So uh, if you learn anything else, we'd be happy to hear that as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Simpson. We'll just move on to the next. Uh, Danny, uh, Mr. McNeely. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you can tell, we we're still waiting for our briefing to uh, to get some answers to some of the questions that we, we have. But I, I just throw this suggestion out here. Um, if, if you have an emergency dispatch system already with employees and staff, why couldn't this client issue an RFP to blend in with the system? So I, I just throw that up. You might want to submit an unsolicited proposal. Um, and 911, we had a number of tragic accidents in, in, in the communities I, I represent. And I, I see this as good modernization value. Some of the elders in the community, rather than uh, memorizing seven numbers, would memorize three numbers. And part of the campaign, I'm hoping that we would have some pamphlets going around, information going around, so that we can post up beside our, uh, our home extinguisher, for example, or home phone, those types, of, those types of materials and publications so we can hand deliver it out to the homes. So I'm, uh, I, I'm in all support for this. I think it's a modernization, and I think our part of the territory should get up to speed with the uh, rest of Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Madam Mayor? Uh, according to the GNWT, they said that they could do it cheaper in-house versus using the cities. Um, and uh, yes, on your point, we are very welcome to, to 911. And um, I know I was in Wekwiti, um, with my previous employment and when we asked the kids what's the call, number you call for fire and they're like 911 and I was like not yet um, but it's it's you know it's pop culture you call 911 um, so I think in, it's just three digits it's quicker to get through so it's um, very welcome we just want to make sure that, again that that consultation is happening because um, it may not just be the city of Yellowknife's infrastructure that the dispatch system that needs to be updated, perhaps other communities as well. So we're just flagging it for, for committee. Mr. McNeely? Yeah, and I, th I thank the mayor for that comment. And who's to say, you know, we, we've got fiber optic down the Mackenzie Corridor now. So who's to say, you know, we, we might have repeater stations between Fort Good Hope and Norman Wells covering that blind area and Wrigley to Toledo, for example. So those, those could be taken into account as, as we move on in modernizing our communication systems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything further from committee? No. Okay, I, I just have a, a, a question. If you can take your hats off as uh, city officials and think about just being individual citizens, ratepayers, 
what do you do you think a two dollar fee on your phone bill every month is 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 acceptable to your cost of living needs because one thing we've heard and we don't really have the general public represented here as well as we we did say in fort mcpherson where we had many members of the community um but do you think that a two dollar increase to your monthly costs is acceptable to pay for this service and we'll start with uh, the mayor madam mayor my hat never from comes off <laughs> um if that's the cost of the program, then um, you know it would be great to find efficiencies, try to decrease that cost. But uh, um, we are going to have to pay for it one way or another. If it's a subsidy from the GNP, then it's just coming. Uh, another program is going to be um, impacted. So um, I believe back when we were getting charged wrongfully, was it 99 cents or? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if possible, if we could decrease it to the rates of other parts of Canada, but understanding where the north, that may be um, the amount that has to be charged. But again, it's that life saving, almost like an insurance program that you can't really put a price on that ability to quickly get through. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm going to pick on Ms. Bassie Kellett. <laughs> What's your perspective on the fee? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. As a private citizen, I mean, I think that having this plan is going to be very important. So certainly from the taking my city hat off, which is hard to do, uh, we do agree that this is a great way to go. We do hear a lot of comments at the city from residents about cost of living and death by a thousand cuts and incremental increases everywhere are impacting on people. And so if there is any ability for this to be as streamlined to meet the expectations, because I think a lot of people have had expectations that this would come in around the dollar mark. That's what it was. This is where we think it's going to be. We know that it's a lot of work to try to make something as streamlined as possible, but uh, if that's at all possible, I think that might be a comfort to people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your evidence. Do you have anything to close with, Madam Mayor? <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> um, no, just again, thank you very much. And um, as we've reiterated multiple times tonight, we would like to be engaged and if the GNWT can do it before we come to standing committee it would be greatly appreciated so relaying that message to your colleagues would be gratefully appreciated thank you uh, thank you very much madam mayor and uh, we appreciate you uh, being in attendance today with and well staffed as well yeah. um, it's not always uh, we would like to work with our partners as well as a committee so it's it's great to have you here and sharing your your challenges and your uh, experience with uh, both bills that we've been talking about tonight so thank you very much you're excused is there anyone else who would like to speak to Bill 31911, North of Territories 911 Act? Seeing none, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for attending this evening. Uh, if any members of the public or those watching online would like to provide a submission on either of these bills, you may do so before uh, Friday, January 25th at 5 p.m., which is tomorrow. Um, on behalf of all of uh, the committee and uh, uh, all MLAs who have been working on this legislation, I'd like to thank everyone very much for participating, uh, not just here in Yellowknife, but uh, throughout the week as we've been traveling around the territory. We uh, greatly appreciate when members of the public do provide feedback, and we highlight it um, when we do create our reports, and we will do so with this one. If uh, anyone has any other questions uh, about the bills, you can get in touch with the committee, um, either through our clerk if you're here in person or on our website at www.assembly.gov.nt.ca. I will now um, uh, we'll take a break and then come back, but uh, we'll adjourn. We'll uh, yeah, sorry. So we'll take a break now and uh, move in camera. So. That concludes the public portion of this meeting. Thank you very much.